Hey, welcome everyone to the ARCHICAD User Monthly Training Webinar for February 2021. This is Eric Fabra speaking to you from my home office in San Rafael, California, just north of San Francisco. And I've got my little pandemic puppy here. So this is Simone. She's four and a half months old and she's keeping me company today. I'm going to put her down in a moment, but I just thought I'd say hello and give you a chance to enjoy puppy love virtually all right all right i'm gonna put you down now and uh let me um just switch over to show my screen as well let me turn off my webcam and show the screen let's go to here and all right so you should be seeing my screen let me know that you can hear me and that you can see the screen. You can use the questions area of GoToWebinar. And you can also, those of you who are in my ARCHICAD training and coaching program can use Slack. I'll be going back and forth and looking at both of them. So I wanna say um, hello then to Kevin in Hong Kong. Yeah, let me know where you're calling in from as well. It's fun. Uh, Alexis, Steve, I know from LA, Michael from Syracuse, Connor, I think you're in Ireland, Paul, I think you're in Oregon, Joe, Randy, Dwight, Todd, Mar Maria or Mariah, um, okay, all right, good, um, so uh, Nicole from Berkeley, okay, and Ian from Scotland, Richard from Bermuda, Alexis from St. Lucia, so we're definitely <clears throat> going from um, what uh, uh, North America to the UK um, and along with Bermuda. Don't know if anyone here is from um, uh, from down under that I'm seeing right now. Um, okay, and Craig is in Baton Rouge. Henry, Stan, okay, and Caitlin. All right. So um, we today's focus is going to be on um, answering your questions. So this is something that I do every week for members of the ARCHICAD coaching program. And every few months I have an open coaching session uh, for ARCHICAD user members. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna show you, uh, we have a lot of questions um, or I have a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions to go over today. Um, so I'm gonna have to move sort of very efficiently. Let me get this up here. I'm just going to scroll through these very quickly just so you can see if your name is on there. Um, these are people who sent in questions ahead of time, and I have a brief summary for my own reference. Um, <clears throat> Joseph Gargione, um, and please excuse me if I get your name um, not quite perfectly. Leif Rideout, Connor Moriarty, Kent Smith, I believe Andy Mel Melarogno, Lennox Archibald, Randy Reuter. Paul King, Mark Wilson, Mike Cahill, Mihail, Tanas, or Tanasi, Jamshed, uh, Durrani, Luther Weber, Eric Milberger, Randy Reuter, but may have listed twice, I don't know, or James Coy, and Caitlin Kelly. Um, <clears throat> now, first thing I want you to do is if you see your name on the list and you are able to connect with audio that's going to be preferred if you don't have a microphone on your computer then be prepared ideally to call in you'll be able to still watch on the computer but you can <clears throat> use the audio setting in go to webinar to switch from computer audio to call in and if you do that then i'll be able to unmute your line it's always more fun to be able to talk uh, back and forth. The other thing is that this will go on for at least two hours and maybe even three. I often spend three hours or more in the coaching program for course members. Um, <clears throat> to, usually I keep the ARCHICAD user webinars to an hour and a half to two hours, but boy, we have like 16, 17, 18 questions in here. So uh, I'm, I'm willing to keep just keep going. <clears throat> so what that means though is that if you have a question and you know you need to leave in an hour or at a certain point, um, then please let me know ahead of that point or just post something in the chat now to say, I'm going to have to leave at this time. You know, tell me based on, you know, an hour from now or 90 minutes or whatever. 
uh, or 30 minutes from now. That way I can at least try to get you in before you leave. All right, <clears throat> now a word from our sponsor, so to speak. Um, I realize that uh, often I forget to do this near the beginning, um, but I just wanna make sure you know about the resources that I create and provide for ArchiCAD users in case you would find them useful. Now, the first thing, this is an ArchiCAD user webinar. So ArchiCADuser.com not only has these monthly trainings um, that I pro provide for free, but there is a user directory and you can add your name to it, uh, put a little information about your firm and it can be a networking um, environment where you can connect with other users, perhaps in your area that you didn't know about or users from other areas maybe you have uh, seen a comment that they made and you want to connect to them to get more information uh, secondly there's the archicad tutorials youtube channel and so let me just switch over here um, I'm, i imagine most of you are familiar with this um, i do actively um, you know create new videos sometimes more frequently sometimes less uh, but i'm very pleased and proud that i've been able to serve right now almost 34,000 subscribers and uh, Four is it four almost four and a half million um, views at this point? So if you'd like to be kept informed um, about new videos here, then you can. Uh, there's there'll be a subscribe button if you're you know logging in to YouTube um, and you're not me. There'll be something that says subscribe, and then there's actually a little bell icon that allows you to get a notice when I post something. So do check that out. Um, the coaching program, as I mentioned, I'll just Zoom this up a little bit, maybe not there. Um, coaching program is a weekly program where I help ArchiCAD users like what I'm gonna do in starting in a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, you can ask questions. You know, I've been doing this since uh, 2011. Um, so, I mean, I've been working with ArchiCAD for 31 years, but I've been doing the coaching program uh, pretty much weekly since 2011. So you can join on a monthly um, or yearly basis there. So it's under ArchiCAD training slash coaching. Let me just put this back here, archicadtraining.com slash coaching. Um, now, if you are, whether you're a new user or a veteran, if you want to get a comprehensive training resource to support your work with ArchiCAD so you learn the best practices methods um, that I teach um, and really can leverage the power of the program, then check out archicadtraining.com. You know, here is um, the home page here, and you'll see a whole long description of what it has in it. And you know, it just goes on and on with all of the things that are in here and who it's for and who it's not for, et cetera. So check that out if you'd like to get a more organized training support program. Um, if you'd like to be able to delve in for particular subjects, whether it's site modeling or roofs or um, complex uh, profiles or anything like that. Um, and finally, um, last ad here is for Master Template. So Master Template is a um, product that I started creating in 2007, along with an architect uh, who's um, working on staff for me at the time named Scott Bulmer. And we created what we considered the most smart working environment most smart, well, uh, smartest. Uh, let's see, the working environment for ArchiCAD that would really speed up your work. Um, and it's been developed ever since by me and would sometimes help with Scott or others um, to incorporate more and more tips and, and ideas and uh, structure so that it embeds best practices methods into the file structure. Um, you know, always create a new version each year. Uh, you can learn about it on AC template.com. So that's the last ad here. We've got 1,800 users from 85 countries. So we have a, both a U.S. feet and inches template and a metric template for international users. Okay, enough ads. Let's look at some questions. Now, I'm going to look uh, at this. I was going to try to organize this in some sequence. I didn't get a chance to do that, but at least I can quickly see who was asking what questions and try to pick them out. So I wonder if Joe Gargioni is on the call. Yes, you are. All right, so let me go and um, uh, open up your line. Let's see if, Joe, you have a microphone. Let me go there. All right, so Joe, your line is open. 
Joe, um, see if you uh, can talk. All right. Um, unfortunately, Joe, it seems like your microphone isn't working. Let me just check that my audio is working. I am set at my speakers. That should work. Let me just switch it off to another thing and then put it back. All right, Joe, try one more time to talk. Nope, not getting it. Okay, so um, I will try to take your questions, um, and you can type into the questions area. Um, he says, I'm sorry, but it works every day. Oh, interesting. You might have to switch what um, which microphone you're using. In other words, sometimes uh, it, it may be set to a funny thing like, um, you know, and then, but you you are unmuted if you can do it. Now, I'm picking Joe's because I can answer these questions relatively easily. Um, and I think it, of course, uh, will be helpful to everyone. Um, so let's take a look um, here. So uh, first of all, at the questions in context, let me go open this up. All right, so Joe says that he is an architecture teacher at a high school, new to Archicad, but he came from Revit um, and he used to teach Revit or has teach, taught Revit for a long time. So he asked about things that obviously relate to his experience in Revit. So can you select windows or doors with a selection box in 3D or plan view? So let me just go to, uh, let's see, I uh, have this sample project. So this is a project many of you have seen ad infinitum, like maybe you're tired of it, but it is one that's provided in master template as a, a learning tool. So it just gives me something that I'm very familiar with and I can demonstrate. Now, in terms of selecting multiple windows or doors, there are different ways to do that. First of all, we can go and click with the arrow tool and then uh, shift click and select multiple ones, shift click to turn off individual ones. So that's one thing. Another is that you can go to the window tool and you can go to the edit menu and say select all windows. And that'll select all the windows on this story on layers that are visible. You know, if the walls are visible, um, then uh, they'll be these windows will be selected. Another option is to use a selection marquee and draw a box, like let's say like that. So this marquee is outlining an area, and you can do different things with the marquee, including just delete everything or drag stuff that's within the marquee. But one of the other features that's a little less known is that you can go to the a tool like the window tool and go edit select all windows and it'll select only the ones in the marquee so not the ones on the other side of the building so that is the closest we have to using a what did you say a um, selection box we call it a marquee and uh, in this case selecting windows now i've got windows selected if i go to the door tool here and i use the command here by the way you can use the shortcut command a or control a now you can see it selected those two doors as well. So we can select um, windows or doors, or you know, obviously um, just add to the selection set if we want. Now, what about in 3D? So let me go into uh, 3D here. Now, in 3D, there is a possible way to use the selection marquee. But before we do that, let's just say, uh, obviously I can go with the arrow tool or with the shift key and select multiple windows like that. And I can deselect by shift um, by shift clicking on a window. You know, so that's sort of standard. Now we can't go and draw a box with the selection arrow here. I didn't mention that um, uh, on the plan because it'll select all of the elements that are included, but it won't select the windows per se. It'll select just the walls within it. Uh, if I go back to the floor plan and we use the selection arrow, and I draw a crossing window, you can see it's selected all of these things, but the window itself is not highlighted, just the walls or you know, the other elements there. Um, but we can use that marquee here. Now the marquee in 3D is a, a little bit complicated in the sense that there is a flat selection you can just draw, but that will only select what you see on screen as a graphic. So you can copy like a screenshot of an area. But there are some marquee options here that are 3D. So if I take this little rectangle, and let me just orbit down here, and I draw this box, 
you can see I'm drawing a selection marquee. It's a little bit harder to see exactly what's going on, on plant, uh, in 3D, but I can then draw um, a, a, a box. So it's a little hard to see, but there is this virtual box. Now, as I move around here, you'll see that the box is on one side of the building is not including the other. If I go to the window tool and say, select all windows, you can see it's selected the windows that were in that box, but not this window or that window because they're not within the box. So you can do it in 3D. I, you know, I don't know how uh, much benefit that'll be, but you can do something like that. Now, let me just hit escape a couple of times to get this clear. Another thing that you certainly should uh, know that you can do is you can use select all windows in 3D and make a change to all the windows in the project that are currently visible. So that you, it's not based on the story. In other words, you're not limited to just doing it on one story versus another. You can do that for the entire project. And that can be useful if you want to change um, the color of the casing or, or um, you know, other details uh, globally um, or add some other data about the windows. Okay, so that's first thing. So let me know, um, Joe, um, uh, still, you, you, if you, your microphone is unmuted, but you have to click on it to activate it, and we'll see, try it again one more time, see if you can talk. So I'm waiting for you to click on the microphone icon, and then it'll show green, and then you, and we can see if possibly you've figured it out. Um, okay, looks like Joe is calling in because I see another entry or maybe he's call, uh, coming in from another computer. So we'll just give it a moment there and review the other questions. So Joe, let me open up this other instance. Joe, the, your other... Hey, I can hear you. All, All right. right. Sorry about that. I was on my school computer, so I just switched over to my uh, my, my desktop at home and it seems to work better now. All right. Well, that's perfect. So where are you? are in Princeton High School yes. in New Jersey. Okay. Yep, I te I've been teaching pr at Princeton High School for the last 17 years, and uh, I bounced around from program to program. And um, just real quick, the reason why we went to Archicad is because with the pandemic, all of our students were given uh, MacBook Airs, and Revit mm -hmm. doesn't work on MacBook. So come August, I was forced to learn Archicad. Um, and I, I told my students, I'm just staying a couple days, uh, a couple days in front of them, but I've gained, gained a lot more confidence. Um, just by experimentation, watching videos, you know, some of your videos have been very helpful. And I really appreciate you still giving me a try here to, to talk uh, with that not working, the microphone not working on the other computer. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad you were able to connect uh, now. So uh, did you follow all of what I was just doing while you were also yes. live? Yeah, yeah, okay. I was very familiar. Everything that you showed, um, I, I knew most of it. Uh, the 3D marquee tool was uh, something uh, I, I don't really use, I didn't really use. Uh, but as far as doing the command A, you know, selecting all windows and stuff, I was familiar with that. I just didn't know if like you can put a, a crossing window and a plan view and just select the windows to to just select. But you showed me several ways to do that. So okay, excellent. All right, so let's move on to these other questions. You said, can windows or doors be mirrored without the wall they are hosted in? So you mean like without uh, mirroring the whole wall? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's just take this door. Um, this door here. Um, now, of course, we probably wouldn't want to flip this door, but we can just for training purposes. So I select the door. I can use the mirror shortcut, or I like doing it when I'm training using the menu so that everyone can see it. Um, so I'll just say uh, that I want to mirror it. When you mirror it, you can mirror it on an endpoint or on a center point. So let me just try the center point, and you can see it's now flipped from a left hand swing to a right hand swing. Now let me undo that and say, what if I wanted to mirror it ac um, across uh, this point? So I can do the mirror command, command M, and click on this point, and you can see it flipped it, so the sides, but also kept this constant. And in fact, you can do the mirror command on a, another point on the wall, like here, and you can see how it flipped around that as the axis. So that's what you can do with windows and it works with, I mean, with doors and it also works with windows. Obviously some windows are symmetrical and some are, um, you know, left or right swing. Now, Eric, is it possible to mirror that door to the perpendicular wall below it at like a 45 degree angle to get um, that, 
you can't mirror you can't mirror it in one step to get it from one wall to another. Okay. Um, okay. So what you'd have to do is I drop this here, and mm -hmm. uh, of course we can then pop it in. We're going to pop it in by either center or corner. In this case, mm -hmm. you know, if I knew that this was eight inches up or ten inches up or something like that, then I might say, let me do the corner. When I hover over this, you can see that I'm on this point. Let's just say I wanted to put it a certain distance. And, and, and actually, let me demonstrate a few things all at once, because these are the type of things that uh, a productive user will know how to do instinctively. But it's hard to, when you're a newer user, to realize, oh, I need all of the steps. So let's say I wanted it to be exactly the same distance. Well, what I'm going to do is use the M key for measure. That's actually the same as clicking here. And say I want to measure from here to there. Okay, now it's 6 and 31, 30 seconds. So let's just say that it's 7 inches there. Mm -hmm. I hit the escape key to stop the measure. Now I'm still in the, the door tool. I've eye dropped the door tool, and I want to make this 7 inches away. Now there's different ways to do that. One is that I can just hover over this uh, point and get the little um, hotspot here. When I move over, um, we can see how far I am from from that uh, most recent point that I uh, stayed on. And then I can just type in, in this case, you know, seven inches, and that will say click at the seven inch mark there. And then it's saying, which way are you swinging? You know, so if I, depending on what we need, I guess, uh, I guess it would be, uh, I guess it would be like this. So now mm -hmm. I'm swinging in seven inches from that corner. And then of course I can go and select this and delete it. So it's not the same as mirroring it across, you know, between one wall and right. another. Um, okay. If the two walls, it, sometimes you may have two walls that are in, in the same plane. One might be taller than the other, or one might have a different surface uh, appearance than the other, or maybe made of something different, you know, like two by six versus two by four. You can drag a door or window from one wall to another um, that are in the same plane, but if they're perpendicular, you know, you won't be able to do that. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So that was the second question. Um, third question has to do with dimensioning. And I know in Revit, you can click a wall and just see a temporary dimension pop up and type in a new value. How, how could you do that in ARCHICAD? Um, or how close can you get to that? So let's just take a look something in isolation. Um, so let me just switch to uh, another instance of ARCHICAD where there's nothing drawn here. Um, so let me just draw a single wall um, here. And I'm just going to draw it sort of an arbitrary length. OK, so it was 13 and feet and something. Now, if I uh, dimension it from you know, this, uh, this point to this point, double click here, you know, it's some odd value. Now, I can't select the dimension and change it like you could in Revit. Mm -hmm. We might say, how could you possibly do that? Because you don't know which end to stretch or whether it should stay fixed on the center and stretch in both directions. Um, that's at least the way I think about it. You might say, well, Revit has a way of locking one corner or, or choosing which one you want to do. Well, what we do is we select the wall, go to whichever end. Let's say we wanted to make it longer this way, press down on this end, and you see here's the option to stretch as opposed mm -hmm. to just dragging. So when I'm stretching, you can see the um, tracker showing some information. Now I'm just going to move it back on top of itself, although I could be um, uh, just anywhere along that line. And you see the distance. Let's say I wanted it to be 15 feet 6. So I just type in 15 feet 6 and enter. OK, so basically, I just start the stretch operation and type in the value that I want and hit enter, and that will make this end point um, that distance from the other end. And of course, the dimension is optional whether it's there. I just showed that so you can see visually that it was, you know, very similar, you know, just a couple of clicks. Just we're not selecting the dimension, we're selecting the wall. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. And if you had a rect uh, a square that was say 20 feet by 20 feet, okay, and you realize, hey, I didn't need it to be 20 by 20. It was supposed to be um, 23 feet by 20. Yeah. Um, right. I learned let me, that. Let me do this. So let's just say it's 20 by yep. 20. Okay. Yep. 
there. Let's get rid of this wall. Um, and then the right wall, you need to push it out about three feet. Okay, so um, we want to get this wall three feet over. Two different ways that you can do it. Well, multiple ones, but two very efficient ones. One is I can go and select all the walls. Now, even though they're separate elements, I can treat this as a polygon. And so I can go to the edge and say, I want to use the offset edge. And then I can say, I want it to be three feet. And that is going to be 23 there. Uh, okay. That's the simplest way is to select all the walls. You can, in fact, select all the walls on the floor plan and just whichever one you touch on, it'll move that one and it'll stretch the ones that are connected. I like there. that. Um, easy. Now, another way you can do it is uh, you can use the marquee. You can draw a box around it and say, well, I'm interested in this area. This will only affect the things that are inside here. It won't affect this one. And we can then go this point here and say three feet. And what did it do? It moved this and it stretched these two. Now, if there were some other equipment, cabinets or whatever, they would move at the same time. Right, okay. okay. And if you That's wanted great. it to affect the entire building, then using the heavy marquee would mm -hmm. make the marquee affect all um, uh, all stories. Of course, you have to be very careful with what you're doing there, but it will, it does allow you to do a 30 story building if you want it. Um, right. Okay. okay. All right. That was great. I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. So I'm going to just, um, let's see, uh, close this here. So we'll answer that question and we'll have the other ones there. So, Joe, I'm going to mute your line. I want to yep. thank you for you know, sending in your question. I appreciate your help. You're welcome. Um, so, by the way, as I go through this, if you see something that you go, oh, I didn't know you could do that, or that's clever, uh, just put a little comment in to either the... Um, I'm going. I'll see you later. All right. Um, you put a little comment into um, the uh, uh, chat uh, here or in the 2020 coaching call uh, Slack workspace. Um, and uh, because then everybody can sort of see uh, what's going on. All right, so let me see. Uh, I do see a couple of comments. So Caitlin has to leave in an hour, so we got to make sure we fit her in and Luther in 90 minutes. And then Will, you have a question about Windows schedule that you just added in. Well, we'll see see whether we can get to that. All right, so Caitlin and uh, Luther, and let's see. Um, Okay, so Alexis says, as an ARCHICAD 19 user, is this webinar useful to me? Absolutely. Um, most things in ARCHICAD have been the same for years. They add new features, but what I just demonstrated about selecting windows, about um, mirroring things, about um, stretching the walls, all of that has been available for, you know, probably back, I don't know, even before ARCHICAD 10. Um, so uh, I think, Alexis, you'll certainly find many things maybe the large majority of things are relevant for older versions. Okay, um, I wanna say hello to Stuart from Melbourne. So we do have somebody from down under and uh, you go from Lima, Peru. And Rob Harrison, you had a question about what's the word on the M1X Mac MacBook Pro for Arcad and Twin Motion. I don't have any specific information on that. Um, I think Rapisoft says it runs, but it may have some issues so I don't know. For those of you who don't know, Apple came out with its own chips a few months ago. For some of the models, they're not Intel anymore, um, and they are much more energy efficient and faster in certain areas. ARCHICAD, like other programs, can run an emulation mode, meaning it's emulating a an Intel chip. There will You have a chip that's running much faster, and it sort of pretends to be Intel. It's going to not use the full power of the chip. But the other question is, is there anything that doesn't work? And I haven't heard. So maybe if it's any of you who have gotten a new M1 Mac um, can post in whether you, uh, whether there are any of you who have done that and are using our kit. Okay, so uh, moving on to, so we have um, Joseph here. Um, uh, this was not in a specific order. Um, let's see, I'm wondering about Andy Melaragno, if he's on the call here. Um, 
And then, of course, Caitlin, I know, has to leave. But Andrew Melorag Melorogno, I'm going to open up your line. Let's see if you are have a microphone. Hey, Eric. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So where are you calling in from? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Excellent. Um, so let me just open this up. Um, so you're fairly new. You've struggled with roofs with a bell cast eave. So we can see in your drawing that it's got this gradual curvature. So the main part of the roof is straight and then it has this radius curvature um, here. Now, you didn't send me a file, so I don't have anything directly to work with, uh, but I will just sketch out a couple of things and we'll just talk about, I'll just say two different ways that you can approach this. One would be a, um, a multiplane roof with multiple um, slopes, and then the other is the shell tool, and we'll talk about um, both of those. Um, okay, so let's go to um, here. So let's just take this particular um, drawing here. I'm going to go to uh, the roof tool, um, whoops, and uh, just use the default settings, except I'm going to switch it to the live on the second floor, just above this uh, this floor, and then it's going to show on the home story and one story down. So we will see it here. And I'll just draw this box here. Okay, so now um, if I go to 3D, you know, it won't be any big surprise. Um, it's just square, you know, or flat sides. Now if I select this roof um, here, we can go into the settings and you can see there's one plane. We can add a plane here with um, a pitch and a uh, an elevation. So what we're going to do is say that the initial pitch. I think that's. Uh, let's take this initial pitch. So this is six and twelve. Uh, let's take it down to four inches and twelve. And uh, let's take the elevation. I'm going to say I think I make this just a small number. Then it'll only go a tiny amount. You can see the tiny amount here. And of course the whole thing is not going up to a hundred feet. You know maybe it's. I'll just put it at twenty. Um, total so you can see how it's showing a little piece here and maybe we'll take it even you know just to 10 10 feet so we've got a um, one at one slope one at another let's just say okay and you can see how we're starting to get a change in um, the shape uh, so let's go in and uh, say that really I want this to only go up a small amount I'll just take it in half here so you can see now the curvature is coming a little lower. So we might need to be even more extreme, um, you know, here and, and say that it's only, it's going up at this slope just for uh, six inches. And then we can add in another one. So here we can see it's just barely at the edge. So now if I put in another one, um, add, whoops, I didn't have it selected. I have to have it selected. Um, if I put in another one, add, and let's just take this one to be six and this one to be um, eight and 12. And let's take this one to be just uh, one foot and then it'll go the rest of the way. So now you can see it starts with one slope, it goes up at a slightly higher one, then it comes to a, a final slope to whatever it needs to be. Um, so if we look at this, you know, it's starting to appear like your thing and you can add several of uh, several planes to get that um, now if you want to do it precisely you can do a section i think this is just a the standard template so i think there's a section cutting through this building um, uh, that we can use um interesting no let's see there we go okay at least we have um this um so this this section here um, so we can see this slope. Now, if I select it here, I can um, adjust it. Now, I can't remember if we can do this. No, I can't. I, unfortunately, in, in a um, section view, while I can see this and I can measure it, um, I can't um, edit it visually. I, of course, I can go in and say, um, you know, really, um, I want to uh, have this, this one, this second one go a little bit further. Um, and you can see now, the curvature is longer, but let me undo that. Uh, in 3D, I believe that we can go in and um, we can select this and we can go to uh, one of these edges 
and there's an option here for adjusting the edge either sideways or up and down. So if I take this down a little bit, you can see how it's the ghost image is changing. And so that allows me to, so you could put in several of these um, points and then just adjust them until you get the section um, that you want um, with that curvature. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Does that um, does that affect the performance at all? Like if you add in a bunch of different facets, does that slow it down think, any? Or I don't think so. Okay. Um, it's 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 pretty trivial for it to figure out you know where those lines are and things like that. Now okay. we do have um, a, a little bit of an issue in terms of it. It really is there. There are these lines here, right? Um, and so if we were to look at this in um, a uh, so we have a white model here. Interesting. So this is the uh, more 3D styles white white model. Okay, there we go. Um, so we're seeing, of course, something that you don't really want to see. You know these these lines um, there. So there's no direct way to remove those lines in this type of view. Although if we were to put on um, uh, change the surface to something. Um, let's give a surface here to, let's say, some uh, tile. Well, I don't know about Spanish tile, but let's see, shingle roofing designer grade. All right, now this is in a white model, so we're we're seeing it with the line. But now if we put it back to um, our uh, 3D uh, 3D views, um, now you can see it. It sort of looks pretty good um, yeah. there. And if we were to look at this in um, a an elevation, um, you know, we're not really seeing that line, uh, the line work um, relative to that. So, um, so that's probably the best way to do it. Now, let's look at the um, uh, the shell tool, which could work, but it may may not be nearly as easy to manipulate a group of of shells that follow this path. So it would be nice if you could create a shell tool, um, the, the shell tool in this view, and actually just sort of draw it. Um, but I actually have been playing around with it and going, hey, it doesn't let me click, it doesn't let me do anything. So we have, as far as I know, we have to create it on the plan and then uh, uh, work with it in the section. Um, somebody may correct me on that because uh, maybe I'm just missing a, a point. But let's um, let's take this whole thing and copy it over. So we can, um, so I'll just drag a copy um, here. Um, okay, now um, this, uh, I'll take, get rid of the, um, the roof and let's put in a shell. So the shell tool, for those of you who haven't used it, can be used for roofs. It certainly is very good for vaulted roofs, for anything, you know, you just have a smooth curve um, uh, instead of a, a flat uh, segment. And you can create it using a simple method where you're just drawing a line and it um, and a and a depth, and it will create like half a tin can. Or you can do something that has a detailed method. I think for our purposes right now, I'm going to use the simple method and then look at it in section um, and uh, uh, and adjust it. Uh, if you if we cut a section like from your drawing, we could actually trace this and create the precise shape. But uh, I'm going to do a little simple shortcut. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to go across um, here and say that it's uh, going up towards this point. Now you can see the the little dashed line. If I go to 3D, um, we'll see that it created the half a tin can there, right? But mm -hmm. when I select it, you can see this blue axis line. Now the blue axis line I can adjust here in 3D, so I can say I want to move this point up in space. You know, so I'll just take it um, up. Now that's obviously a weird shape, but now I can go in here and change the curvature, you know, perhaps to um, something. I probably have to see where where am I going to get the best control? Um, let me just make it inverted, and now I think I can probably um, uh, just adjust this. Now, actually, let me now let me do it in um, the elevation. So this would be, I think, maybe an east elevation. Um, so what I'll do is I'll select this. Um, let me just drag this um, up there. Take this point and say I want to move this point 
to here, and then take this curvature, um, you know, something like that. Okay, so now um, uh, if I look in 3D, you know, I've got something starting to approximate that. Now, this is a true arc in the sense that it's got two points and just a curvature, but I can add more node points. Um, so I think probably doing that in the elevation is where I wanna um, attempt to do it. So if I go to this and I click on the blue line, I can add a node point. Now when I, add, when I do that at first, it's basically gonna straighten it out. It's sort of an odd thing, but now I can add node points. So I can go adjust this now, of course, I'm I'm following roughly the, the what I had done in the um, uh, previous exercise um, there, but you know, let me just tweak it a tiny bit like that. Um, these, because we can make them curved, um, I don't think we can fill it. It uh, actually we can. I think we can fill it. This um, that just added a little curved segment there. Um, so in fact, let's um, let's just take this point and move it on top of the other point and then curve this um, uh, curve here something like that okay so you can see that that here i can literally define some points and then have some control points you know where it stops being straight and has a curve um, so if we uh, now go to 3d um, we can see that I've added one node point and we do have that curve. Now, technically what it's doing, you can see the segmentation here. Uh -huh. So it's not actually a smooth curve. The, the blue line is a, is a smooth curve, but it's creating some segments. So there can be some limitations there, but ultimately you can create multiple blue points or you know, multiple node points and get that. Now, let's just say that we had that. What are some of the issues that we might have? Well, one is we need to go to the edge here and look at the edge angle and uh, uh, edge type. Um, we can change the surface, we can change the edge type, edge type for measurement or calculations, but we can't, I don't think we can change this edge to be vertical. Um, I think it's always gonna be perpendicular there. So we don't have the control of the fascia. Um, now you could apply another fascia there, and maybe I'm incorrect about um, about that. I'm not, let me just go hover, no, it doesn't allow us to, um, define that let's see here's this uh no it doesn't unlike some other tools like the slab tool we can't change the angle so that's a limitation um now if we wanted us to uh meet up you know and cr create a ridge line of course we could mirror this um, on the floor plan um so if i were to mirror a copy um here um and now look in 3d um, we do have something that sort of looks like that roof, but it actually technically these two are not meeting. Now you could uh, take the you could take the um, node line here and say I want to instead of adding points in the middle, you want to add more points to it, and then you could go down and let's say you snap to this point and snap to that point there, and now this one element is going on both sides. So, you know, you, there are ways that you can um, get, have it all be unified, but I'm not quite sure how you would deal with something like we have here where we have a hip. Okay. Um, there, I mean, there, probably there would be a way to do it and you'd use some solid element operations or connect operations and it might be actually very graceful, but um, you, you're not, uh, you know, there's going to be some more, it's going to be more fiddly than doing this one. So I would prefer this one myself to trying to use the shell tool. Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's just see if anybody has any comments um, on that. Um, all right. So I just see some thank yous um, here. Um, and okay. So don't see any more comments there uh, but you can give applause if you like you know so to speak virtual applause if you think anything I do is like magical or really helpful <laughs> um, all right so let's see Caitlin has to leave um, actually in 12 minutes it seems like so I'm going to um, need to uh, switch to her if we can help 
you, Caitlin. So um, anyway, uh, uh, Andrew, thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Oh, that. thanks for the answer. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so let's see, Caitlin. Caitlin, I've opened up your line. Um, so can you hear me? Yeah, I can. All right, okay. so let me, let me just go find your file um, here. Okay, so you have two questions. One has to do with modeling and the other has to do with project migration. Yeah, maybe um, the, for the project migration, if you want to just, uh, I just had a question like it, when I open it, it asks me legacy or I think advanced was the other yeah. option. And I didn't know what to select there. And then obviously all the windows and doors and those things are, are missing. Okay, so the short answer there is when you migrate a project from before ARCHICAD 16 or 17, I think it's before 17, um, it had uh, different rules for calculating intersections. So, you know, nowadays, if you have a wall and a slab passing through each other, then ARCHICAD will analyze what the wall is made of, what the slab is made of, and it will um, then say things that are stronger, like concrete, will have priority over things that are lighter or you know less dense you know like uh, stucco or cladding um, things like that uh, in in older versions it would not do that and so uh, the reason that there's the legacy option is if you opened up an old project and you simply wanted to look at it maybe print it out then using the legacy mode will mean that arcade will try to make it look exactly like it used to and of course mm -hmm. that's valuable if you're not really changing it at the moment. Now, if you're going to develop it further, you're going to turn it into a current project, then I would say um, switch it to the advanced non-legacy uh, option, and then just where you see some things that are not looking the way you want, you know, fix them. Um, so that's, that's the first part. Um, legacy, if you're just going to do some printing or just tiny little modifications, um, advanced if you're going to really work on it. Um, now, library parts are not there, so you need to load old libraries. So when we're migrating a project from an older version of ARCHICAD, we do have the option, I'll just go in here um, to the library manager and say, in addition to the standard library for the current version that you're using, you can go add in into, let's say here, you can add in the migrations library and the migrations library will support support any parts from earlier versions of ARCHICAD that have been superseded and replaced in later versions so that you don't have missing library parts but it only goes back to ARCHICAD 13. Okay. Now the ARCHICAD migration library is old uh, has 10, 11 and 12 um, here um, uh -huh. so you can do that. Now you have a project in 8.1, so you would have to probably load. Uh, you might find that the, you know, that when you do this, maybe the 10, uh, maybe if you load both of these two, um, let's say I just say choose this, and then I say add the other one, um, mm -hmm. uh, old one here. You may find that many of those parts are located and they're not missing because they were still in, you know. Uh, compatible through 10 or 11 or 12 or something like that. Uh, but if there are things that were from 8.1 that really ARCHICAD says, I don't know how to draw that. I don't know how to draw that type of window. It's, uh, you know, it's just not something I know. Then what you need to do is add in a historical library. And the historical library, of course, you might have it on your hard drive, you know, from an old installation of ARCHICAD, but you can download these things um, in, um, from the Graphisoft website. <clears throat> so if I go to uh, graphisoft.com <clears throat> and we go to the down to the bottom to support and downloads. Um, so here's ARCHICAD versions with historic stuff. Um, I think um, I think maybe we have to go to historic version downloads here. See, this is 18. Um, supported versions here. I'm not sure where you're going to find the ones earlier. They don't have it easily found. But if you did do a search, just Google for ARCHICAD 8.1 library, 
um, here. Um, you may oh, find okay. you may find that um, here, like Jared has a link. Oh, at Shunome. Okay. Okay. Um, from Shunome. Now he it's his links are now dead. It's super frustrating. Um, okay. Update here. It was actually just last week ago. Um, unfortunately, update. Okay. Um, all right. So. I'm not quite sure. You you may find if you're posting, it was a pain because I could open the file with 8.1, but didn't have the old libraries. Oh, well, I know now. All right. Um, so you may find people like me who have old libraries. So if I go, let's say here to my thing. So we say um, Archicad 8.1, whoops, 8.1. I do a search um, like that. Um, so Archicad eight, Library 8.1 Mac, I have that in my Archicad Library archives. So I could send that to you. I don't think that I'll be breaking copyright. I don't think that Graphisup, you know, has any objection to that. That'd um, be awesome. Okay. Um, so you can see I've got this. Now, is there a difference between 8.1 Mac and PC? I don't know. Uh, there used to be some more differences between them, but um, uh, this is probably something that I could just send you. 77 megabytes, I can send it to you. So okay. uh, just drop me a note to remind me, and I'll I'll give okay. you. Okay, and that's fantastic. Great. All right. So those were some of your questions, and then um, your other one, SEO. Yeah. So this is kind of odd. I haven't experienced this before. So in solid element operations, I'm trying to trim. So I've got this uh, thicker retaining wall. This is on a, that steep site. And I'm trying to trim the retaining wall um, and uh, on the exterior. And you can see I've got these terraced uh, uh, situations at the entrance there. And um, I highlighted the operator element to show you mm -hmm. how I've got it stretched to the point that I want to trim the retaining wall. And um, for whatever reason, it's just not letting me trim okay. All right, so you're saying you want this, is this like earth here? Yeah, that's, uh, it, it's the slab tool and it's it's earth, yeah, and then the, the front door, it's concrete. And you're, trying to, and you're trying to cut out part of this wall around here? No, I'm trying to cut out uh, again of the house. So you see where the siding is and you oh, see so that this, wall? So this blue through. line is slightly Im immersed into the wall? Correct, yeah. Okay. All right, well, probably the issue has to do with building material priorities. Okay. which are referenced first before solid element operations. So if, let's say, this was earth and you stuck it into the building and then the building is, you know, in the same space and then you say, I want to trim this out. Well, the problem is that earth is, of course, generally a lower priority. You pile the earth around the building, you know, or you plunge the building into the earth and, the, you know, whatever it's made of, whether it's wood or steel or concrete or, or even stucco, Archicad by default has a higher building material priority. So the earth is just going to stop. The way to work around it is you create another version of earth. In other words, one that is for just this type of purpose that looks exactly the same, but has a higher priority. So it cuts into it. And then you don't even necessarily need to use the um, solid element operations, although you can because it's now has priority. So let's just take a look at that in in this simple environment here. Um, so I'm going to take uh, a slab um, and let me just do this on the plan. Um, so let me just draw uh, a slab here and I'm going to deliberately cut it part way um, there. We'll go to 3D and we'll just see what this is doing. So this, this slab right now is sitting underneath the wall. I'm going to just do the simple case. I'm going to make it just a simple one out of something like um, what would where's earth uh, uh, where is earth earth here down at the bottom okay all right so now it's earth now I'm going to make this uh, thicker so I'll say that it's uh, I'll just take the top up um, like this just sort of arbitrary all right now if you if I select it, you'll see that there's a green line right here, and it's basically giving way. If I go into a section, and let's just go to the section and uh, move this 
section, drag it over there, and then open it up. Um, so we say open with current view settings. Um, all right, you can see that the earth gave way to that. Now, what if I made this out of something other than earth? Let's say that I made it out of um, uh, concrete structural. Now, it's stronger than the wall, right? Um, yeah. Now, if we wanted it to be earth, but um, actually cut into the wall, then what we can do is we can go to the options, building materials, and say, here's earth. I'd like to create a new thing that's a duplicate of earth, and I'll say earth strong, you know, give it whatever name you want. It's exactly the same, but now I'm going to change the building material priority to a higher value. All right, and you can see how it drops down here. Now it's got a much longer bar um, here. So now that just, just created one. I haven't changed this particular element, but now I can easily say, let me make it earth strong. And you can see it's retain, remembered earth, but now it's stronger than that. Um, uh, so that's what you wanna do. Now, if, if we wanted it to just barely cut in here, um, then you know I'm gonna just pull this back, whether it's maybe to the um, you know the cladding here or something like that um, uh, there. And if we go to the section, um, we should see um, I guess section here. Um, you can see now it's just sticking in there. Okay, so so in essence, I need to go and select the my operators, see what what the um, the strength of that element is, and, and make it stronger. That's right, because this happens without even um, analyzing the, uh, without even doing the solid element operation. I see. I now, see. if we wanted the solid element, uh, element operation, I'm just going to demonstrate this. There are times when you want to say uh, that I want to cut a groove up or something like that. I mean, this would be odd in this case, but what I'm going to do is I'll go to the solid element operations. I'll select the wall, in this case is the target. I'll select the slab as the operator. Now, subtraction already has happened, so we don't need to do that. But if I did subtraction with upward extrusion and execute it, you can see it's now cut mm -hmm. um, a groove up there. Now, we can't isolate it to being only up to you know, a certain level. So you'd have to do something else if you, if that was, if you didn't want to take it all the way up. But that's that's what's going on is that the complex uh, uh, thing, the solid element operation happens after the intersection calculation. So let me put this back now to the earth um, uh, here. So this is now earth. Interesting. Okay, so this, um, interesting. Let's see what's going on here. So. Wow, that is odd because I see now the this is giving way here, but it is still cutting that. I've never, I wouldn't have expected that. I would have expected it to stop dead and not do that. So it might have to do with the sequence of operations. Um, so that's an interesting oddball. So, that, so Eric, that's kind of interesting. Then are you saying that like if I were to put so then by putting a house on a site, if I let's say you've got this slope, so normally what I do or what I've done in this particular case is I've used solid element oper uh, operations to um, set the house down into the slope. But from what I'm understanding from the priorities, uh, the, the building material priorities is that I really wouldn't even need to do that. That's correct. Ah, oh, so then that saves all the solid element operations. Yes. So as long as the, the earth is lower priority, which of course it would normally be, right. um, you, can, you can have stem walls and footings and foundation um, stuff uh, just buried into the earth. Uh, now, if you need to have a crawl space, if you need to have some uh, an air void between you know the floor um, uh, if it's not slab on grade um, yeah. then you would need to do a solid element operation um, with an element sort of underneath the floor um, for a crawl space right. um, the other the other proviso is that in order for these two to um, intersect like this um, so let me um, let me just go and and 
intersect it um, or take it um, in uh, further. Uh, interesting there. The solid element operation is actually working in this case. You can see how it's it's uh, cutting off all the wall. Uh -huh. I've put that in there. Um, but the uh, let's just take this. This is it's Earth, so this is the lower priority. Um, yeah, I've never. I've are never you still? Uh, are the is this solid element operation still active? Look at, or? Look, at look at what's going on here. Yeah, it's it's actually giving way to this. Yes, yeah, see, that's what's, happening in my, that's what's happening in my model uh, with the solid element operations yeah. giving way, but it's not, it's not um, okay. showing, um, yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, clearly if I make this the, um, the earth uh, strong, you know, then we don't have a discrepancy um, mm -hmm. there. Uh, so if you do want it to cut in, then, um, you know, we'd do that. Now, uh, the other thing, what was it? Um, uh, let me just, uh, with this selected, um, and I'm just going to cancel a solid element operation here. Um, so now if we if we look at this in the section, of course, it's cutting through because I've made it the strong one. Mm -hmm. um, in order, um, it, I don't have a solid element operation anymore. Let's look at what happens if I put this on another layer. So right now it's on the A Slabs 3D layer um, here. And we can see there's all sorts of other layers I could use, but let's look at the layer settings. All of these are on number one layer intersection group. You notice there's something called tiles here and trim and mm -hmm. walls partition. These are ones that are not going to intersect um, with the uh, the walls. And there'll be other ones here. It's 3D general. Okay, so let's, um, or L site. Okay, let's put it on L site. So what I'm gonna do is change this layer to instead of slabs, in this case, I'll say L site 3D, you can see the number eight. And you see now they're passing through each other mm -hmm. because when they're on different layer intersection groups, they ignore the building material priorities. They just pass through each other. Now we can do solid element operations and it'll just, you know, do you want to cut this thing out of the, 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 um, the earth or do you want to cut off the bottom of this because of the uh, you know what you're putting underneath it. So if you have them on different layer intersection groups, then solid element operations is simpler to you know, and because they just pass through each other until you um, do that. So I'm not sure you might have some combination of. I, I'll have to look at that. I, I as far as the 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 layer and the priorities and things like that. So that's something mm -hmm. I wasn't looking at. Okay. Okay. I'll check. All I right. Well, thanks, Caitlin. I know you have to go. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Eric. You're welcome. Um, so I'm looking at um, uh, some comments in the, uh, what do you call it, and go to webinar. So Kevin Young says, good idea to download individual historic library. Haven't thought of it before. Uh, definitely what I do as a consultant and as a trainer is, you know, whenever I install a new version of Arquette, I keep the old one on my computer. Now, I can't open up ARCHICAD 8.1 anymore, or even probably ARCHICAD 16 or 18, because I've got a modern Mac and it's not compatible, but I have kept all the libraries. So um, I would do that. And particularly if you have projects that were in an earlier version of ARCHICAD, even if you remove the application, keep the library. Um, so Yasek, hey Yasek, it's been a while. If the 8.1 version was saved archived, archived with the library parts it would open, uh, probably you can save um, projects as an archive file, which includes library parts. Uh, how complete it'll be is a little bit iffy. In other words, there's some things that the um, archive process won't grab, but it'll certainly take most things. Um, and then you're opening a PLA. And in fact, we do have a question from someone about the PLA, so maybe I'll go to that next uh, after, I know Luther has to leave. All right, and Joseph had to leave right there. Okay, and Dave Norman, speaking of libraries and migrated projects, can you recommend a workflow to remove duplicated library parts? That can be a little bit complicated, and it's best if I have an example, David. Um, and I know, I think you're part of the ARCAD coaching program, so you can certainly um, give me a good example and we can work through it. Um, so this thing with the PLA is one I want to 
do, but I know that Luther had a question. He said he had to leave. So let me get Luther on the line here um, and open up this. So we have 116 people on here, so that's great. Um, going to be interesting to see how far I can get with all these questions. So Luther, your line is open. Can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. So tell everybody great. where you're calling in from. Um, well, uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Okay. Um, and your question, let me just get this um, up on screen here. Um, okay. Your question was had to do with layers and about how to work with favorites, putting them into folders, and how to migrate them or import them into a template. Okay. Um, so let's just start with the favorites and the layers is something that, um, you know, you could have a long discussion with it, but the favorites, at least I can show you a few things very quickly. Um, and given that we have so many questions stacked up, let me focus on this one. Um, okay, so uh, we go in here, so I'll just go to the plan. All right, so for those of you who may be very new, you have access to some frequently used parts under favorites. So when you're in recent versions of ArcCAD next to the tool, there's a little uh, pop-up menu and you can say, hey, I want to do a floor with concrete or I want to do a generic floor or I want to do something that's not even a floor at all. I want to go to ceilings. I'll use the slab tool to do that. Or you might even find um, uh, that um, no, there's no, actually, they're not using the slab for earth. Uh, so but you can see these folders here. Um, and uh, if we go to um, you know, the floor and say, I wanna do concrete and gravel. So that would be essentially something for the for grade purposes. So let me just draw that um, here. We'll go to 3D um, and you can see this thing that I just drew. You know, there's our con concrete here and I guess that's supposed to be gravel. Um, there, okay. So that's favorites. Now favorites, um, you can, if you select something, so let's say that this, there's nothing too special about this, but let's say we wanted to make it a favorite, then we can go into the settings and we can go to this little favorites icon and say that we'd like to save this as a favorite here. And I'll just uh, call this, um, I think it's uh, Earth Strong um, uh, for uh, modeling. I don't know. So I'm just giving it a descriptive name. It now shows up with a preview, and given how thick it is, you know that's what it looks like there. Um, and if I were to activate this later, then um, I would be um, either creating a new element or modifying an element to use that. Now, where did it um, where did it put that favorite? Well, again, if I press down here, it's in the current folder. Oh, well, it's really not a floor. It should be somewhere else because um, it's, it's not flooring. Okay, so what? How would I organize it? Well, we go to the window menu, palettes, favorites, or in many versions of ArchiCAD, like in the US, we have, um, and let me just pull that palette, it's it's um, off on my other screen. Uh, many versions of ArchiCAD, you'll have a little icon button with a star, and that turns it, or opens and closes it. Now you can see when I'm in the favorites palette that I can see all of these folders, here and in fact within the design one you can see beams columns etc that are um, showing so we weren't seeing that we were only seeing the ones that related to the slab tool um, there's an option here for whether to filter to active tool only and now you can see all of these are sort of grayed and the one that says slabs is the only one that really is solid i can't even but i guess i, I, guess I can click on them but i can't um, but it won't show me anything within it. It'll look empty there. So only the ones that are, um, you know, like this. Now I can go grab this and say, you know what? I'm going to put this into the generic slabs one. So now in the generic slabs, I've got this one. And then these are in folders. And if I wanted to put this into, you know, another folder like roofs, not that it would belong, I could just drag it in. And now it disappears from this folder. And of course, it's now in here along with with uh, that. So that's how you work with folders. You can also create a new folder here. You know, let's just call this terrain. Um, and that right now, that folder is 
within the roofs one, but I can just drag it up and put it into slabs. So basically, now if I go here, I can drag this into it. Um, now, where did I put it? I, did I end up putting it in terrain? Things sort of scrolled. Yeah, I did. All right. So that's how you create folders, how you move things around. You have to be in the favorites palette to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So um, the uh, you were talking about bringing something into you know. Yeah, like if you have if you have old projects and you and you've spent some time building things and you want to bring them into uh, the template current job template you're working on. So we can go to the import export command from the favorites palette and we can export things and you can say selected favorites only so let's just say that um, I wanted just the slabs this would be all of the slabs here um, uh, and you can say import export you see here it says it's going to export 351 here it'll export just um, interesting zero okay so I probably have to um, uh, can I I can't okay in slabs if I select um, all right, so I've selected these down below as opposed to just up here. Um, this is sort of where I am. This is what I've got selected. And if I go to export um, and I say selected, you can see there's nine favorites within the folder. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's an option when I say export. Um, well, I guess it, it's just going to create a favorites file um, with that. Later, we can go into another, um, you know, the other copy of ArcCAD, the other project, and you can say import and use import a file or a folder um, there. So that would be how you can migrate favorites that you've created from one project uh, to another or one template to another. Uh, the proviso or the little thing you have to be careful of is I just created a new building material here called Earth Strong. Um, that doesn't exist in the other file. When I bring in the favorites, it'll record the name, but it won't record, it won't actually import that building material. So you need, to, you would need, to, if you have created some new wall types or building materials, slabs, um, etc., cetera, um, those would need to be brought in in a separate process. And the main process that you would use there is under the options menu. It's called attribute manager. and attributes include things like the building materials and so if i um, look here and i sort by name um, here's the earth strong so i can go and uh, save this out or save multiple ones out in a temporary file that then i can save out and you know i don't want to go into all the steps here but we can sa um, save out uh, things um, and then import them into the other file um, so that's w one way to do it but another way that can um, be even simpler is to simply go and let's say on the plan, select, um, you know, here's here's this element, but I can select more than one element. You know, let's say that, you know, these, these three elements I knew had new things about them. I can go copy them and go into the other file and paste. And when I paste, it will bring in the attributes. It'll bring in the new type of earth or whatever other materials or surfaces that are referenced here. So if you just have a whole bunch of things that you've created, what you might the simplest thing might be to draw a bunch of them as little pieces on the side of a plan and then copy them and paste them into the other file. And mm -hmm. they will bring in the definitions of the attributes. Then when you bring in the um, favorites, I believe it should work. It should find Earth Strong over on the other side. Great. Okay, so that's a you know very quick crash course on that. Sure. Uh, and uh, here, so the layers. Um, very very quick comment is um, each template will have its own handle on the way that layers are dealt with, and I'll, I'll just give um, you know sort of the quick thing in um, in the U.S. standard template. You know, they are organizing things by A for architecture, you know, um, G for general, L for site, MEP, um, structural, et cetera. Okay, so there's a category. So that'll help you to def decide whether, um, you know, um, I guess, uh, is it something that's um, a, a structural framing or is it, um, is it a column? 
you know, so, well, I mean, you could have structural framing that's vertical and it could be actually a column. You decide that, but the one that's structural is probably going to show up on, um, what do you call it, on structural layer combinations. So here we have SAF is a type of structural um, um, model. And of course, structural is showing. Um, but if I were to go to, um, let's say, 3D views, uh, well, structural is showing as well here. Um, their template, I still find somewhat, I don't know, it, 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 it does things that I don't feel um, like I fully understand because I don't use it, even though I teach with it sometimes. Um, but ultimately, these layer combinations, whatever they are, are going to be associated in many cases with drawings. And so if you say, hey, I want to do a structural drawing, what layers are turned on? Well, we don't have the landscaping layer on. We don't have um, things uh, you know, like zones. Uh, we don't have um, some of the notes that are irrelevant there. Um, and we don't have furniture. So you know, that's that. But that's going to be pretty similar to something like um, uh, sections. There's going to be only some slight uh, differences. But notice here that these structural things are not showing in a section. This is where I would go to Gravisoft. Why are you showing a section without structural framing? Hmm. I, I can't even yeah. imagine why you wouldn't show us structural framing. So this, this is their um, standard this template. Is their standard template. Now, uh, if we go to master template, which of course I know better because I've created it and maintained it and optimized it. We go to the layers here, very different, much more, many more layer combinations here. But if we go to, let's say the S layers, you know, for S framing members, all right. So the framing members here for structural do show up on um, certain drawings like a foundation or dimensioned um, here. Uh, they do show up on sections um, here. They will show up on structural drawings, structural framing or structural roof. Um, so those are the main ones. But we're not going to show the framing members on the floor plan because they're sort of the main purpose of this would be something that's buried within as opposed to visible, you know, naked, uh, you know, as certainly you can have framing members that are exposed. Um, but if I do go down to uh, something like, you know, the conduct structural framing. All right. So this is showing various things here. It turns off a lot of the. Um, things that are not really structure related. Um, but of course it does have to have the walls and it does have to have the slabs and, and things, but it may not have, um, you know, so the floor finish, you know, might be removed and um, you know, other things. Now your specific question um, here, you said, uh, will something show up on structural or electrical, et cetera? Okay, so what you need to do is just play around with, all right, structural framing, all right, electrical. Okay, electrical stuff is not showing. If I go to um, Condoc Electrical here, of course, the electrical elements are showing. Um, so you can click back and forth to look, but you can also look and say, all right, electrical lights, they are showing on, on the left side, electrical and elevations, because these are 3D lights and switches um, mm -hmm. here, and they're showing on the MEP systems, and the reflected ceiling, you know, because we have lights in the ceiling and sections, et cetera. So you can click on a layer and see which drawings it's going to be viewed in, or you can click on a, uh, a layer combination and say what layers are used. So that's how you would analyze it regardless of the template. Does that make sense? Yes. It's just right. um, your, your, view set, your setup view sets are very, very handy and it's just i guess it's just a matter of getting really familiar with which layers are off and on mm -hmm. when you're creating a certain line you know using a line or a wall yeah absolutely so you know when you're in you know in a project and you've got these views each one of the views is associated with a layer combination as well as other settings and so uh, while you can adjust it if you need to in general, they're designed so that, you know, when you have a view that's going to create a drawing, the right layers are turned on. Uh, so uh, I think we'll move on if that's okay. Sure. All right. Well, thank, thanks, sir, Luther. Uh, appreciate your uh, questions. Thank you. Um, so let us go here to um, anyone else who had to leave. Let me just know.
there. All right, Caitlin says thanks. Um, oh, and Luther, you also had some uh, things here, some situations where walls of the same parameter don't heal in plan, even though they're healed in 3D. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. I'd have to see what um, what is well, happening. Yeah, basically, the, the I, I'm getting this a lot for some reason. I, I thought maybe it has to do with the end tool, end wall tool, but um, it, okay. the exact same parameter of wall that meet in a corner, and often the the end of the wall won't heal like that. And I'm okay. trying to figure out. Um, I'd have to see it in context because there are a lot of different things that determine how the line work is drawn, and. Okay. You know, it's, it may take me two minutes, it may take me 10 minutes, but usually right. I, can, I okay. can go in there and go, hmm, no, or let, you need to change this setting. Um, but I don't have an instant answer for what's going on there. All right. Yeah. I can, for another time, I can send you a example. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So let us see. Um, and I'm just going to go and just for, so I can see. So Luther. Let me just cut that and put it at the end. Um, and Caitlin, we did. So you two, let me just say uh, completed here. So I'll just make this a little easier for me to see here. Okay. Um, and I know we did do a Joseph here. Put him in. Okay. All right. Um, so have we only done three people? Wow. <laughs> oh, no, I did Andy. That's right. I did Andy as well. Um, so we've done four. Okay. Um, and I'm going as fast as I can. All right. Um, so, Randy, you had a question about PLA files missing surfaces. Let's see if Randy is on the line right now. Um, Randy Reuter, yeah. Okay. Um, Randy, your line is yes, open. Yes, I'm here. Um, and, I, and I see you also had a parametric diamond window, so you had two questions. Um, yeah, I think I figured out the window deal. I I made a window, uh, selected it, saved it as a library part, and it punched a diamond-shaped hole. But oh. then when I tried to use the library part maker, I discovered that it can't punch a diamond-shaped hole. It only does a rectangular hole. Hmm. Okay. So, um, I mean, the short answer is that uh, when you create a custom window, um, there is an option to uh, use a, a um, to define the cutting hole using a separate slab um, and giving it a designation that says this is a wall hole. Um, and right. Then, and then you're saving that outline of the cutout along with the actual 3D elements. And Archicad will right. let it. That's, that's how I got it to work, but I was hoping to be able to make a window that had more parameters. So then I went into the the library part maker, and it wouldn't cut the diamond shaped hole. Okay, so the library part maker I haven't really used to be honest. I've heard people mention it here and there. I, uh, you know, should look it up and get familiar with it. Uh, I imagine that you can use it for certain things where you make things parametric but then if you if it's missing some feature like being able to cut out a non-rectangular shape someone who's an expert in gdl and i would say i'm somewhat of an expert i'm not i don't do it very much these days uh, but could, someone could go in and say all right you've created this thing it does a lot of cool stuff let me add one bit or an extra bit that adds the wall hole script um and that right. might, in your case let's say it does 10 cool it things missed, and it's missing in this one. Case, i think that my the diamond window that i created and just saved as a window is going to work just fine i was just hoping to have different options for trim on it right but okay. that's that's i can deal with it <laughs> okay. all right so um i'm glad you you figured out a usable I'm, I'm actually hoping that someday they allow us to use custom profiles for trim on Windows. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so yeah, that that would be that would be nice. So here's your file you just sent, or that is the PLA and the and the um, file. What version of Arcad is it in? Twenty three. Twenty three. All right, and your question was. Um, well, when I the the file I sent to you 
is the file that I started working in, and it had a lot of missing surfaces. Yeah, so let's take a look at that file um, here yeah, that you sent out. It was out. actually saved as a PLA, which I thought included all the surfaces. All right, so right now it is still downloading. And in fact, it's taking a while. I don't know why. You can see this little um, mm -hmm. circle has just barely got a pie. Oh, now it just did half oh. of it. Uh, <laughs> I do have fast internet, but for whatever reason, it's it's taking a while. But now it looks like it's going to get there in a few more seconds. Yeah. All right, so when you save a PLA, let me explain for those of you who are less familiar with what the heck is a PLA or an archive. Um, the idea of it is that you're saving a version of a file along with supporting materials, primarily library parts, um, so that in theory, when you get it to its new home, whether it's another computer that you have or to a consultant um, or to another person who's going to take over the project or something, um, it has all the library parts. There are some options there. Let me just open this up. This is in 23, so let me launch a new instance here. Um, and we'll open it up. But while I'm here, I'm just going to switch over to um, this file. There's nothing much in here. In fact, we don't even have any library parts. But if I go to the file menu and I say save as, I can use save as to save, um, let's say, the current project the first time, you know, like give it a name. Um, now, by the way, this is from the, the opening thing, so I'm gonna go to that in a moment. Um, uh, so when I'm saving it, I can save it, you know, just for the first time. I can also go to a new folder and save it just as a project, so I have two copies. You know, that's often good for backup purposes. Um, we can also switch what, format we're saving and so depending on what you choose you may be saving just a screenshot of your current window or you may be saving a dwg file from whatever's in front of you like whether it's a layout sheet or a plan or a section so save as is versatile now one of the objects uh, one of the options here is archicad archive project that's what we're talking about here it's going to be a pla file even though we don't see it up here it, it will put a pla now, in the options, there's some checkboxes, okay? So there is something about linked textures. If those linked textures are not included, then um, the PLA can go across, but it will be missing those. So that may be what the issue is, is that okay. there are texture files that were not included because this was unchecked. This takes up space. It makes the file bigger. And so um, it. I can't say if it was saved that way or not because I didn't save that file. Yeah. So that would be the main thing for for that. Um, so let me just um, uh, check the your file, which I'm just opening up. So it's saying, do I want to read the elements directly from the archive, or extract them, or select a library? So I'll just do this first. I can always extract it later. Um, and I can always choose a current library um, to fill it out because this will only have the elements that were in use. So if there are three window types in use in the project, it'll only have those three windows. It won't have other types of windows that are standard um, in ARCHICAD. So that's why you would usually, uh, well, you would at some point select a standard library to supplement whatever is in the archive. But let's just yeah. see what's in the raw archive. So I'm opening up this PLA. It's going to have the building itself all of the view map and the layout book. Uh, I don't have library part maker loaded, but it'll keep that information um, in the file. Um, so it'll be the project, but it is only carrying in right now the library parts and surfaces that were included in the, what was saved. So here we see, um, you know, certainly uh, a view, whoops, uh, here looks okay at first glance um, there. Now let's look in 3D. Um, we can see that there are these weird checker boxes. Now the checker box is indicating yeah. that this surface is not in my current environment. Now if I select this roof, right now it is a composite um, uh, here. It has various overrides and the edge here I'm going to focus just on the edge right now. Timber, pine, grain, horizontal. So that surface, if I go to the options uh, surfaces and we go to uh, timber, 
let's see, timber, pine, grain, horizontal, you can see the same image and says it's missing it. It's missing it, it's called pine grain 01-opt-gs. Now this one looks like it's probably from the Archicad migration libraries uh, because it does look very familiar as a name, even though it's sort of an odd name. So what I'm gonna do is go and load in, in the library manager, in addition to the um, elements that were <clears throat> included in the file <clears throat> and the embedded library, I'm gonna add in, <clears throat> excuse me, two, two libraries. So I'm in RCAD 23, so I'm gonna um, load in the um, standard library. Now that will probably not help in this case, but let's just see what happens when I say okay. <clears throat> we may see some changes, we may not. It didn't help for me. Okay, so now <laughs> let's go and see what happens if I go to the library manager and I add in the migration library, which supports versions of ARCHICAD earlier. And we did this here, ARCHICAD migration libraries. So now I'll say, by the way, here's our warnings, 830 things. There are duplicated ones. All we really care about are the missing ones. They're only from the attributes. They're only these surfaces. Now let me reload, having just added the migration libraries and see what it does. See if that 830 changes. It's gonna <clears throat> read it and compare notes. Now we may have a, a higher number because of duplicates or not from attributes. See, now there's only a few that are missing. These mm -hmm. are probably more specific to that project template as opposed to the library, but most of them have been found. Now there are duplicated because some of the ones that are in the archive may match some of the stuff I've loaded separately. Right. These usually ignore, in other words, yeah, there's some stuff here, but they're, they're, if they're really duplicates, we won't, you know, they won't cause any um, significant issue. Um, so these are the ones that you won't see. So let's just say okay, and we're going to see an update. Well, do we see an update here? Mm -hmm. um, so what is it? Let me just. Um, uh, oh yeah, it just had to refresh. I just did when I did a little bit of refresh. So now it looks good. You know, I mean, uh, there may be something missing, but generally it looks good. So you just need, in this case, to load in the migration library support because, and I'll tell you why, what, what, what it is, is if we go to um, uh, library manager and we look at the migration library here. Does that migration library come with your standard uh, installation yes. or is yeah. that something I need to get? No, it does. It does. Okay. And I'm going to open up just to see what's in the migration library. And you can see there's object library 22. There's probably a very small number of parts that were replaced in 23 that they put in here. But you see the surface catalog? This is all of the stuff that you were missing. You can see all of this um, uh, okay. stuff here that was missing. So let's go to the wood, um, wood 22. See, these are all the pictures. And why were they missing in 23? Because they've provided better more high resolution versions of them in 23. Sure. And okay. so they basically said, we don't want to accidentally make your project look different. We'll give you better textures, but they'll have different names. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, if you're opening up an older project, you will need to use the migration library to support that. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that'll answer your question. Um, and if they had, if that person had saved it with the, um, the textures embedded, then that wouldn't have come up, but we do have a fairly simple um, thing. Now, the library manager, as I did have library manager um, in here, the missing parts, there are a few. So if these are important, then you want to see if you can track them down either on your computer or someone else's computer. But on the other hand, if there's only five or six, it doesn't take that long to fix anyway, so. Okay, there you go. Yeah, all right. Okay. So let's see, I think that was uh, this one here. So I'm gonna close that ticket. Um, and I know you had the other one, which did we go over the that? The one about the window, I, I got oh, that. Oh, right, we, we did talk about that. Yeah. And so this one, I think I'm just gonna 
um, parametric diamond window. Okay, so I'm going to close that. Um, and I could spend some more time on windows and things, but you already have um, that there. Now, Arcade User Access Lewis is um, trying to attend today's session. Let me just get him um, his okay. link. So, Lewis, Thank you, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. So we're Bye. in here. Um, and let's see if I can get him his link so he can join us. Um, So Luis, oh, I don't, he isn't for some reason in there. Maybe he canceled his uh, thing. Oh no, one, two, one of three. Let me just do uh, Arios. No, he's still not um, selected. Uh, let's see if I get this one more time. If I can find him. Otherwise I can share the registration link here. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I can copy this. So let me just send that to to him. Okay, we've got that one done. That one uh, here. Let me reply. Um, All right, um, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna close this now that I've sent it. Okay, um, so trying to keep track of these things. So we did, Randy, got that. Um, there, and then you had another one. All right, how are you all doing? You want to just give me some feedback? You finding this interesting, useful, etc., cetera, um, or not? Boring, dumb, hard to understand. Okay, Cecilia so says, have to leave, but this was all super helpful. Kevin Young says, besides favorite setting, could we migrate part of a building detail, like waterproofing across different PLN projects? So migrate part of a building detail, like waterproofing. So I'm not quite sure what you mean, Kevin. If you're talking about can you take a detailed drawing from one project to another, you can um, probably the simplest thing is to copy the line work from a detail and paste it into a coordinated detail on your active project. Um, another thing you can do is you can uh, have details be independent, not linked to a source, and it can be part of your template. So you can have, um, when you start a project, you can have a bunch of standard details included, even placed on sheets, and um, that may save you time, particularly if many of your projects use the same details. Um, okay, so uh, I see Connor saying good, Yasik saying good session, thanks, Mike saying doing well, Michael Runyon saying interesting and useful. Okay, glad to see that. Um, let me just see from, um, okay, and in my coaching program. By the way, those of you who are not in the coaching program, if you find this useful and you'd like to get my help more frequently and not when I'm trying to rush and cover everything quickly, then join the coaching program, archicadtraining.com slash coaching. Um, okay. And we have a work, Slack workspace where we share files and, and you know, discuss things um, there. Okay. Um, so thank you for the feedback, everybody. All right, and I think oh, these are completed. So now we have Leif, Connor. Now, Connor, I know it's getting pretty late there. It is uh, 10.42 in, in uh, Ireland. I think you're in Ireland. Um, so let's see there. And uh, and anyone who's, you know, just um, going to be leaving soon, but you're hoping I get to my your question, please let me know. So Connor, let's see if Connor's on, first of all because um, we have like over 100 people on the call. There we go, Connor. Connor, your line's open. Hi, Eric, how are you? Good, good. Um, so let's get, you have two questions. Um, 
Yeah, so you, I sent you the PLA for, for a project I was working on. All right, so you, um, how do you insert a marker that identifies the XY grid position of its placement in the worksheet if the sheet is set up for purposes of inserting ordnance survey maps? Okay, so <clears throat> this could be a complex question, but let me show you a simple thing that would be part of the solution. <clears throat> um, uh, let's see, let me go to RCAD 24, the standard template here. I haven't done anything in this project. Um, this project has sections, it has elevations drawn, a uh, little mini section for a wall section, and then down here, there's some stuff, at least in the US version, that relates to what you're talking about. See, there's a north arrow and there's an XYZ point. Okay, now let's just take the north arrow. Actually, that's a survey point here. You can see this one. Let me just drag this. Look what it does. Okay, it's giving me numbers based on the project origin um, here. And uh, now it has, um, or actually, um, interesting. Okay, it's just one element, sorry. It is a survey point which includes the north arrow. I was thinking that the north arrow was separate. But let's look at this. I imagine this um, survey point object <clears throat> is in the uh, available in the international version. If it's not, I can certainly send you this one. In fact, it says it's built in, so I, you know, I would think it would be there. So it has some controls for the sign, which can follow Project North. So if you say North is in a certain direction, it'll follow it, and you can have some text and change those things. And there are some different styles that you can use. Um, then it has coordinates. Do you want to show the coordinates? If I turn it off, then we just have a north arrow. If I turn it on, then it'll allow you to do, you know, is it X, Y, Z in your language? And show height. So show height from the project zero or from, you know, sea level or from some other reference level. So this can be a grading point <clears throat> if you use the gravity tool to place it on top of um, a, a, a mesh. Uh, might be the, the thing to do. So there's a gravity icon here. It has a little plumb bob um, uh, symbol. And when you place, whether it's a tree or a chair <clears throat> or this symbol, you can put it there. Now the XYZ, it's not saying where this is coming from. And I don't see an option here for um, what it's referring to. So I think this is going to be probably based on the project zero, regardless of anything else. So <clears throat> um, you would just place it in relationship to the, the origin here. Now let me just copy this and see what happens if we use it in a worksheet because you mentioned something about a worksheet. Um, yeah, so I'm specifically using the worksheet because that's how I've inserted the uh, source ordinance mm -hmm. maps. All right, so here's a location map worksheet. So this is in the US template. It just has the word location map. It has nothing else here. It's intended that you would paste in you know, a graphic and that this might be placed onto your layout sheet. Now it does have an origin point. All draftable views in ARCHICAD have a project, have a project origin and you can temporarily change your user origin to measure from a corner of a building or things like that. But let's see if I can paste in this um, thing here and let's just move it. All right, yeah, it is showing a number and if I move this, it's showing different numbers. So it, it is live relative to that origin. So what you'd need to do is place your, your survey or whatever it is <clears throat> in the right distance from whatever your geodetic reference is. And then you can put this marker um, to indicate the locations of things. Yeah, that's perfect, Eric. That does exactly what I needed to do. Okay, excellent. Um, let's just see one more thing. Can we turn off the um, this entirely? Um, doesn't look like it. Sign type, follow Project North, readable here. Um, so it's interesting. It doesn't seem like you can turn that off. Um, uh, you could hide it. You could probably maybe make it tiny. Um, but I'm not interesting. So it, it, it seems like it's going to have that Project North thing um, nearby. Um, maybe well, I should be able to figure out something I can even just make the pens non-printing for the 
Yeah, I mean, you can you, you can make it white pens, perhaps, or you can yeah. put a little cover fill if you didn't want it. <clears throat> At least that's what I'm thinking. I don't think show on all stories. Yeah, it's, I don't think we can do that. All right, so that was one question. I'm glad I was able to point you in the right direction there. Um, so this, uh, why am I not seeing it? Oh, it's, I have it on my other screen, that's why. Um, all right, so this one we've got. Um, and, excuse me, let me get a sip here. Um, Dropbox folder, you were sending <clears throat> something. New roof on a ruinous site with an existing perimeter stone walls. It has a series of folded roofs and you'd like to know the best way to model the portal steel frame at each end of each roof section. So I don't know, this may be too complicated to get into, but we'll, I'm always open to looking at it. So <clears throat> this file is in what version of ArchiCAD? Uh, 24. All right, 24. Uh, some so here. Yeah. Um, now, if I open this up, let's just take a quick look here. Okay, so we've got folded roofs here, and I guess I can flip through this briefly. Um, okay, so we have folded roofs. Interesting. Um, all right, so you're talking about doing something like at the ends of the roof? Yeah, at the end of each section, there's a, a steel portal frame that starts off in the column and then turns into the roof rafter, and then timbers between each uh, steel section at the end of each roof, supporting okay. the standing seam metal roof. All right, so there's, there's um, let's say, two general ways that I would consider doing it. One is using a, a built-in um, add-on for ArchiCAD called TrustMaker. So it's something that is sort of a separate little mini environment for creating trusses, um, and it can create the shape based on you know what you have in a section uh, there. Uh, you can define it based on uh, lines, like in other words, you can have red lines on the outside and blue lines in, in the middle, um, <clears throat> and each line will have a definition of a type of member. In other words, is it um, is it just a rectangular piece or is it a profiled piece? Um, and there are some options there, um, and you can create that, and um, that becomes something that you can actually repeat, you know, because you can certainly have multiple supports across an area. <clears throat> so that would be one would be trust maker and the other is you could simply just draw beams and columns um, in here and, and they have gotten a lot smarter in recent years so that that gives you maybe more flexibility um, at the expense of the fact that these are all separate little pieces so let's just take a look at that um, file so the file um, okay so I guess did I actually um, I know that um, if I go back to, how do I close? Okay, we're back to here, all right. So this PLA, uh, I think, has already been downloaded and it's in 24, did you say? Yeah. All right, so we'll go to the 24 one here, go open this PLA. <clears throat> so I think it went into here, Carla Exchange and Here's the PLA. It's, I'm getting a spinning ball at the moment while it's thinking about it. Oh, probably because these are, um, I, it hasn't been downloaded there, but it finally did come up um, here. So I'll say open it. Um, so I don't need to save this little thing. So, <clears throat> What I mentioned about TrustMaker is um, I haven't used it very much, uh, just a few times here and there over the years, um, but it does allow you to draw essentially a schematic drawing of the uh, structure and then a, a create something that is a, a model element that can show up in your design. Um, <clears throat> because I haven't used it much, <clears throat> um, I, I may stumble and in fact, I may just give up and just sort of say, here's where you're going to use it. Um, but let's see if I can quickly get something, at least um, a starting point. Um, okay, so we'll close up the favorites here. We've got our 3D view. Um, so let's uh, take a view here. Maybe let's go to the other side where we don't have the signage, um, perhaps um, here. And now what do you have here, actually? Do you have a curtain wall? Um, it's 
Yeah, well, it's up source. That's how it's modeled, but it's actually going to be a, a polycarbonate rain screen detail. Okay, so actually, you know, it does occur to me that a uh, curtain wall could be a good solution. I had, it hadn't occurred to me just now, but basically we can create a, a member going across here and a member going across there, um, and they can have any shape you want. So in fact, since you already have that, are, are these verticals sort of roughly where they should be? Um, yes, they're, they're correct, but they're um, just the jointing seams on the polycarbonate panel. They're just what? They're standing seams or they're joints on the polycarbonate panels. They're standing seams. It's a, the glazing there is actually a polycarbonate plastic panel. And there's kind of a top hat uh, capping detail that joins the different vertical strips together. So they're, they're purely a rain screen detail. All right, so this is a rain screen, but it actually is um, an interesting example. So what I'll do is I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna create a copy of it so this would sit outside the structure? Uh, well, no, actually, it's it's underneath the overhang, but outside the structure, yes. That's right, so, okay, yeah. that's what I mean. All right, so let me go to the plan um, here. And let's just actually, yeah, let's let's use the curtain wall, because I think we can probably do something pretty good, uh, you know, pretty, well, certainly we can make something useful um, there. So where is this? Um, okay, um, so, but, I, so Archicad, one of my Archicads has just um, quit. So of course I have a lot of Archicads open. So I was daring things. Um, okay, so uh, um, we'll have to see which ones have quit because it, it may actually have had a little cascading effect. Um, uh, it looks like, all right, so let me just see. All right, so let me see this 22 one. I'm going to close out of that. I didn't use that. Somebody had sent in something I thought was in 22. Um, and all right, this one we were. It's Keithan. This was one. Oh yeah, this was one I opened for just showing how to. I don't know. We did this earlier, so I'm just going to close this um, here. Uh, that's not yours, is it? No, it's not. Um, no. Okay, um, so let me free up some memory here. Um, so now we're in 24, so you're in 24, so let me try opening um, that thing. So where was it? It was in my Dropbox, Carla Exchange. Here's this, um, launch a new instance. All right, let's see if I can do this. All right, so different ways to you know handle these things. Curtain wall could be one. Um, truss maker could be another. And just creating a bunch of separate pieces, you know, beams and columns. Um, if you did a bunch of separate pieces, you have a lot of flexibility there, and you can group them, you know, so that you could easily move them all around. You could you know duplicate that group. Um, but if it is a systematic thing. Um, in other words, like it, it does follow a rhythm with re repeated members, then, um, you know, the curtain wall could make a lot of sense. Um, and Trustmaker, frankly, is sort of out of date. So, I, in fact, I would, I think I would even prefer to do curtain wall to Trustmaker because it just has so many um, options. But we'll see how it goes with your file here. Hopefully, let me just see. Um, my memory, um, this is showing that, oh yeah, now I have 12 gigabytes available. I don't know how low it had gotten um, there. All right, so, um, okay, we've got this. We're gonna rotate this around um, here and let me go to the plan and taking a little while to just bring up the plan, getting a spinning ball. All right, that's all right. Um, so, where is it? Is is this the signage yeah, side? And this that's is the it? signage side. Yeah. So the left hand side is the gable you were looking at. All right. And so, um, do we have the curtain wall layer turned on on here? I don't know. Uh, it's possibly showing on the first floor as opposed to the ground floor, maybe. Okay. So let's go up a story. Um, and let me just go to the uh what is it curtain wall tool and do command a 
All right, so I can see highlighted now that one there. So if I select this curtain wall, no, that's a Perlin. Um, God, uh, let me change this view to be not true line weight. That'll be much easier. Select all curtain walls. So now I can at least see the curtain wall line. So that is the curtain wall. All right. Um, now what I'm going to do is actually, uh, I'll later I'll embed it, but I'm going to actually drag a copy of it out. Um, and is is it is this line perpendicular? It doesn't really look perpendicular. Um, no, that's following the boundary line, which is okay, off right. the weird angle. So there's a lot going on with that. So uh, if I move along this edge here, you can see the blue line. Now I can snap to the perpendicular, I believe. Um, so I've just made this up. Uh, you can see the little plus sign below my cursor, tiny little plus sign. That means I'm making a copy and I'm just gonna say, move it out um, 0.3 meters there. All right, so now if we were to look in 3D, we should see an extra piece that's just been popped out and it's not trimmed by the other thing um, there. Uh, so, um, let me go into, do we have a, an elevation of this? Um, I think so, yes. All right, um, you wanna point me to the, um, let's bring this up. Uh, so we're going to do sections elevations here. Well, okay, so we have standard ones. I don't know if you've created other ones. Um, um, primarily, I think I've worked with the standard ones that you've got there. So oh, right, I don't know about here, so. square on it. Which one of these would probably be the best one to look at? Sorry, no, um, which is the, uh, to try the west elevation there. Doesn't look like it's been set. Uh, that's actually it there. That's where you've taken the um, that's where you've taken the rain screen out, so it's not trimmed, so it's blocking out everything oh, behind it. It is all right. So um, uh, this is the one that I just uh, created there. Okay. Um, now let's see. Can I make this transparent um, so we can see through it? Um, so the panels here. Um, glass satin. So, um, wondering if I were to make the panels just a glass clear um, here, will we see through it? No, we're not. Um, uh, that's the panels and the distinct panel also will make them, that glass clear. But we may also, if I want, I'm just trying to see if I can get quickly get this to be uh, as where we can see through it. If I go to the, um, uh, okay, deselect this and elevation settings. Um, is there an option for model view, model display, um, uh, fill uncut surfaces. So we, we have transparency. I want to have transparency. Let's see what, what that does. Yeah, okay, good. That's what I wanted was I want to be able to see through um, this. So in the curtain wall um, options uh, here, I can change the, the top of it. Now you were, were you doing it just as a trim? Uh, yes. Okay, so I can go to um, a point here and I can say I want to, let's see, if I, uh, actually, I guess I have to um, say edit the curtain wall. All right, so now I'm editing the curtain wall and I can um, show the scheme grid. You can see here's this arbitrary grid here and I'm gonna um, hide the other elements. Um, so I'm just seeing this grid pattern and you can see this line here, that's that's how high it was. This is sort of a theoretical line. Now I'm gonna select this. Um, should be able to, whoop, what did I just do? Um, am I still in editing mode? Let me. Uh, okay, I'm not quite sure what I just did. So let me go back to that. 
uh, section, see if I can do this. Um, maybe I got out of the editing mode um, here, edit. And show the scheme grid. Um, and I select this. Should be able to select this and edit that interesting. I'm pretty sure if I select the grid and then go to this point. No. Here it is. Okay. I don't know why I guess why I don't know why that is, but let me move this point to now we aren't square to this in terms of the elevation. So this may cause some let's say I may not be accurate uh, precisely, but let's just say that if I um, take this and add a node point and take that up to the intersection. So what I'm doing is I'm defining the outer boundary, right? Um, and if I go um, and take this point and move it down to here, um, and of course, I do need to be consistent with whatever that point is. So I'm just going to go in and, and perhaps do that. So this is now the boundary of this um, shape. And if I turn on the frames, we can see now the frame of this is showing just cut there. Now, if I turn off the environment, this is what I've got um, in terms of the curtain wall. Now, um, if I go now to the curtain wall settings, I can say that the um, the frames for the boundaries are going to be made up of something, right? So, in other words, let me just um, uh, I can pick various types and I can have a profile there. Uh, but let me just make this in, in whatever shape this is. Let me make it bigger just to show what it does. So, if I say I think it's this width that we're going to see primarily on in our elevation view so instead of 0.04 what is that that's 40 millimeters that's an inch and a half um, so let me make it a um, uh, hundred um, um, so a tenth of a meter that would be four inches roughly so that's the width of it and when I do this and say okay you can see it's now gotten thicker the width here. Now, right now, this this uh, gray line is the the line that I drew, and it's centered on it. And so, what I'm going to do in this case is say that overall, I want the boundaries the the boundary to be um, uh, the outside, and put the frames inside there. Okay, so you can see the heavy line is what I traced. And this is inside there. Um, now I could say, you know what, this upper part is different than the others. So I could literally select, um, I think, let's see if I uh, select this. Should be able to select all of the, all of these in a row. Usually there's an option that allows me to do that. Maybe in the, in the section we can't do that, um, but we should be able to uh, select all of them. Um, all of these. Let me just take the, these ones here and we'll go in and I'll just show that we could change um, this particular one, like the, these one up in this section to some other setting um, here um, or another width. I'm just going to make this even bigger just so that we can see um, 0.2. Um, and I guess we're in a PLA, so that's why I don't have the other profiles that we would normally have in the curtain wall tool. But let's just see this and we're going to see that I can make this another shape. So what we're- So I could make that a kind of an I-beam section then in that case. Exactly, right? exactly. So the PLA doesn't have those in it, but if I if I had loaded the full library, then you, you, know, you have the option of um, either using a standard profile or you can um, create a custom profile, um, you know, just a complex profile. So think about it. You can make this one and the, the the top two the same, or you can make you know a different one for each each section. Um, bottom one, of course, separate. 
And then these um, divisions, of course, right now they're evenly spaced, but you could literally go and select just a line. And let me just demonstrate, if I grab this line and move it, you can see I can adjust it and I can even delete a line. Um, actually, I guess we would delete the, um, we delete the frame here if we were to do that. I think um, let's select it. Oh, well, let's see if I select the frame here, so I can delete the frame whether I've moved it or not. Um, so let me just undo back a couple of steps. So I could leave it in the same original position um, here, um, and uh, you know I can go and select the frame and remove the ones that I want or change that it to a thicker one. So in other words, at certain points you might have thicker ones uh, or different different structural stuff. Does that, uh, you think that'll allow you yeah, to Yeah, get... I, I think I should be able to work with that, Eric. That's great, thanks a million. Okay, so I would just make sure your section um, or your elevation is uh, parallel to, the, uh, to it. Right now I just sort of cook, took the one that was yeah. uh, closest. Um, but this will work now. Let's just say um, I'll exit edit mode and you can see it actually, you know, it's fit in there. Let's go now to our 3D um, and you can see I put it outside the building there. This is the new yeah. curtain wall, but obviously it's it's would easily fit underneath with the structure. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, so curtain wall would be my preferred one. You know, you could do it from separate pieces, but this gives you pretty much the same controls, and it's all one unit, and you have more more controls of the system. And can delete all the glazing elements and all the other elements part of that roof rafter without yeah, any. Yeah. So if if we don't have if we don't have glazing, so here would I go in here and I'd simply say that in the scheme that this panel here is not a distinct panel; it's a deleted panel. And this one as well, deleted panel. So, okay. And now you can see it actually is just sticks. You know, it doesn't yeah. have any glazing in there as opposed to the one behind it, which has a surface. Now it's a little hard to tell, but I'm, I'm um, you know, certainly I believe that this is just sticks as opposed to having panels. That's great, Eric. Thanks a million for that. All right, excellent. So let's um, see if there's any comments or questions. Um, all right, so I see uh, Doug Muir says lots of helpful info as usual, and Maria, Maria says this is interesting, useful session, but I have to go. Okay, uh, go to sleep. Okay, so I guess it's uh, late where she is. Um, so Connor, I'm gonna go on then? Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Eric. All right, thanks for Cheers. your questions. Um, so we let me go back to my list here, and it is 311. I'm going to make sure that I we type in here into the training thing. Um, so uh, I'll just say I'll be continuing the ARCHICAD user coaching clinic rather than ending it and starting our member only session. I'm just having so much fun. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, um, but you see, if, if, if you're just, uh, if you're an Arcade user who's not part of the coaching program, you're missing out on this every week. We usually don't have as many questions. It's usually more like four or five questions that I cover, sometimes six or eight, but um, but it's always interesting. Okay, so let me go to uh, uh, here and say, so Connor, we had both of these there. Okay, so we have Leaf, Kent, Lennox, Paul. All right. So any of you who are on here who need to go, let me know. Um, and uh, and if it's urgent, in other words, like you really are stuck and you really need my help, let me know. Because if we don't get to all of them, then I want to at least do my best to help the ones that are um, 
more important, you know, trickier uh, there. Um, now, is Leaf on the call? This could be pretty straightforward. Um, uh, Leaf, there, old friend. Leaf, I've opened up your line. Do you have a mic? Hello, hello. Hey there. So, uh, how is it down in Santa Cruz area? It's wonderful, wonderful, gorgeous. Well, As usual. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we certainly the weather is taking a turn for the the better. Um, you have, we had a bunch of rain. You had a bunch of rain, didn't you? I mean, we had some rain, but you had a lot of rain there, right? But uh, still not enough. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So the, your question here. Bring this up. Um, so give me a new name, Bob. Um, I don't know where that uh, came from. <laughs> All right, so you were unable to import your keyboard shortcuts from 23, so you did a new custom scheme, saved it, but this morning it's not there. Okay, all right, so I technically, I don't know if you can do keyboard shortcuts from one to another. We'll just do a quick test, because it's also good to know just in general how this works. Now I have, this is 23. Okay, so here's 23. We haven't really done anything. Um, you know, this is uh, just... Uh, it's got nothing in it. So what are keyboard shortcuts? Well, you know that if you do Command S or Control S, you're going to save. If you do Command D or Control D, you're drag, etc. Well, you can customize these under the Options menu, Work Environment, Keyboard Shortcuts. Now, the things in the Work Environment only affect your computer, but they do affect all projects that you're running. It's basically how your computer and how you relate to your computer. So obviously, if you wanted to have something, and I'll go to the edit menu here. Um, actually, I'll do a search for intersect. Okay, intersect is in the edit menu, um, and it does have a, um, a little icon, this one here, but sometimes it's nice just to have a keyboard shortcut, so I can click in here and then do command I. It says, not assigned to any command. Interesting. Ah, I would have thought that command I would have been for something, but I'll just say assign it. All right, so now this is a key, uh, custom shortcut. So under shortcut schemes, here's our standard shortcuts, and here's the one that I've just modified to have that. Now, Leif, you've probably done a bunch of different shortcuts, right? Millions. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm going to store this, and I'll just give it a name, Leaf here. Okay, just as um, there. All right, so now I've done that. Now, uh, in general terms, if I've saved it under a name here, and I say okay, and then I quit out of ARCHICAD, um, you know, here, and then I reopen it, it should be available. Um, if, you, uh, if you open up another copy of ARCHICAD before you've closed this, it might not have those keyboard shortcuts. So that would be one thing you want to do is make sure that you have not only saved the project, but you've quit out of ARCHICAD so that it goes into the preferences for when you start the next one and you know when you're starting a next one, if I say new here, work environment profile, this also has to do with it. If you're if this profile isn't, doesn't have the information, you know, like you said, your keyboard shortcuts weren't there, right? Um, so uh, so there's that. So what is the current profile? Well, in this case, under the work environment profiles here, the current one is not saved because I could look at the standard profile, et cetera. It doesn't have that. But if I were to say, you know what, I want to create a new profile and we'll say, um, uh, we'll just give it Leaf's name here. Um, and I'll say it's going to have this, this particular short scut scheme as opposed to something else. So now I've got a profile for the whole environment, including where my palettes are and how, you know, I like my guidelines to be done and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I'm saving this as a profile. So now Leaf is the uh, profile and I can activate that at any time including when I start a new session of ARCHICAD. So that's that's basically the things I would look for saying hey it wasn't there this morning did you save it as a profile did you save it as uh, did you save it as a scheme and then did you save that scheme as part of a profile. I now the other thing is let's go to your keyboard shortcuts here go to shortcut schemes, there is the ability to not only store it saying, hey, you know, I want to give it a name, 
but I can export it. So let's just say export it, leaf um, uh, keyboard shortcuts. And um, uh, I'll just, well, it's, it says scheme, uh, scheme export outside of uh, in my downloads folder, that's fine. All right, I'll just say export it. All right, and say okay. Um, so I've just exported it. Let's go into Archicad 24 here. And I'll go to the options, work environment, keyboard shortcuts. And of course, you know, that intersect um, here, there's no keyboard shortcut. Well, you know, how would I get it in there? So I go to shortcut schemes, I say import, and then it remembered, it's sort of nice, or maybe there's a default here for, um, for this. And here it is, there's the leaf keyboard shortcut. Let's see if it'll bring it in. I'll say import. And then here it is. I'll say I want to apply the scheme. It will be applied there. And now I go to keyboard shortcuts and we go to intersect. So you go, go back here. There it is, Command I. So it does work. Okay, cool. So basically, you know, do your keyboard shortcuts. You know, um, we turn this off. You can uh do things from the, the menus you can do things by just looking up a command by its name etc um, then you've got it'll say custom you're going to store it give it a name um, here as a scheme that includes multiple keyboard things and then you can export that to a file and then in another copy of archicad perhaps on your laptop if you're working on your desktop or on somebody else's computer that you're borrowing um, or that you're sitting at, you can import your keyboard shortcuts and have that as an option that you can turn on. Um, so that's that's the basic thing. And it does work from 23 to 24. I'm not sure if it's always gonna work from one version to another, but it did work in this case. Yeah, perfect, super, thanks so much. You're welcome. Um, so let us see here, this, um, where am I? Uh, where is this here? Okay, so solve that, close that. Um, go to leaf, take this, put it into the completed. And I guess this will also be nice if I wanna have a, a list of like what we covered and, and then find the timestamps. So the recording, which is gonna get very long, will have at least a, a, a map. All right, but we're down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we had like 18, so I've gone, I'm halfway through. Okay, um, now uh, let's see other comments. So Oren Mills, great job, looking forward to other webinars. Lawrence Brill, you need to create a heap of keyboard shortcuts for your most used words, especially Archicad. Keyboard shortcuts, well, that's another type of keyboard shortcut. Um, all right, how many times have you typed out Archicad? I just type in ACD and it auto corrects and you would use hundreds of words thousands of times a year. That's my tip to you. Okay, so that's, um, I don't think you can do that in Archicad, the keyboard um, abbreviations, let's call it, but there are tools and I can't remember, I think I have text expander, but I just never use it, frankly. Um, so that's the a Mac one that I believe does exactly what you're talking about. It auto corrects, it changes some obscure thing like ACD which isn't a real word, into Archicad. You know. All right, so Connor says, when I went to the object browser looking for survey point, another object came up in the search results, which is just the 2D coordinates called coordination 2D16. Okay, well, that sounds like it'll probably do what you need. Um, and so it might be something from an earlier version of Archicad that's been made available through the internet. So when, when you're in the object tool, you can search for something by a keyword like coordinate um, or survey or something like that, and it'll try to find you objects within the, the current libraries as well as possibly out on Graphisoft sites on the internet. And then you, if it's on a up in the internet, you can download it, add it to your project library. All right, so Kevin says, uh, tips on custom keyboard shortcut is cool. I agree. Okay, so Lawrence says, this is just a life hack. Yes, I agree. Um, and uh, I do use a lot of shortcuts, obviously, but that's just for some reason I've just never got it. I have Text Expander, I just never seem to set it up. All right, so let us see here. 
Lennox, are you on the call? Lennox is not. Okay, that's too bad. Um, I might still answer his question later. Paul King, are you on the call? Um, Paul, no, he's not. Okay. Kent Smith, is Kent on the call? Um, I know you have an A, Kent Smith. Uh, no, he's not. Okay, so these three, at least you're not there. Mark Wilson. Um, Mark Wilson, no, I don't see him on there. Uh, Mike Cahill. Um, Mike Cahill, you are on the call. Okay, all right, let's open up your line, see if you are still there. Mike? Hi, Rick. Hello hey. there. So, uh, How are you doing? Good, good. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Swansea in Wales, UK. Okay, excellent. It's getting pretty late there. It's it's nearly morning. <laughs> oh, not quite. It's it's a nearly midnight. You're just burning the midnight oil, right? Um, uh, exactly, exactly. Thanks for taking yeah. me my question. Okay, so if you have a site where you wish to have different plan orientation, they're set by angle ref only. So are you rotating the view on screen? Yes. Okay, and then if you update a plan with the wrong orientation, you get a blank screen. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. We've moved out uh, of the viewport. When, okay. when okay. you export the viewport out to to drop it into the into a drawing sheet, yeah. uh, it will be exported with the plan orientation set to it. But if you um, redefine it, you may well use the wrong one, and it 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 just goes blank. Okay. Uh, all right. So I, I understand the basic I ideas here. Let me sort of, first of all, teach everyone um, a few tricks about angle orientation. Um, and uh, let's see if I have, um, let's see. So we have this complicated project from there. Uh, so I'm just going to, by the way, I'm just going to save. This was interesting enough that I'm going to save a copy of it. Um, so this is uh connor moriarty um after coaching session so and i'll just save this there um and then uh we'll just create a, a new blank project to demonstrate a few things so there are different parts of rotating um a view or rotating things on screen um that can be confusing because they're they have each one sort of has its own nuances uh so the simplest thing for me to do is to create the, the simplest project i can um and then uh just explain how certain things interact um so you mentioned something plot one is 45 degrees plot two is 100 degrees okay so we'll um i'll just move over to the side i, I don't want to worry about the section markers there and i'm just going to draw uh a, a, first of all I'll draw one rectangle here that's at the normal angle um, i mean normal on the axis here i'll take another one that is going at uh, 45 um so just if i hit a i can type in 45 and then I could type in the length, but I'm just going to leave it alone, whatever that is. And now I have something at 45. And you have another one. Um, uh, we'll just put it down below that's at 100 degrees. Um, so I'll do um, A100 um, here. Okay. So we can um, differentiate that. And, and just to be really clear, um, let me just um, uh, put in this and we'll put 100. Um, there and make it big enough that we can read. Um, okay, um, and I'll drag the copy of it up to here, and we'll take this. This is a 45. Okay, so oh, okay, and actually that that both of those texts are a little too small. Now what happened? Oh, I guess I dragged. I, um, let me. Um, copy this let me undo back a couple of steps so now this is here and i'll paste in the thing i copied that's a little trick there i dragged it instead of 
copying it. And um, because I didn't want to lose what I had done, I just copied it. Then I undid back to where this was, and then I pasted in, pasted this in. And what I want to do is just make these even bigger and uh, use some settings that'll make them ra um, fit in with the the actual elements. So what am I doing here? I want to uh, make them, uh, let's say, twice as big. There. Okay. Um, so. Uh, let's say that uh, I wanted this to be at 45 degrees, um, like 45, um, and this one at 100. Now, you you may anticipate the fact that when I turn it to 100, um, it actually flipped to upside down compared to 100. It's 100 reversed, so it didn't get upside down um, there. Now, now let's look at rotating the view. So if I say that I'd like to rotate the view graphically, so there's a this is where you can see it says zero, and I can say um, set the orientation graphically, and I'll take this point and actually say this angle should go to here, or actually it should be the other. Let me cancel out of that. I want to say set it graphically, take this current line and move it horizontally. Now you can see that this part of the building is, um, what do you call it, uh, oriented on the axis there. Um, now it says 315, which is what I just did. I can also go here and say I'd like to save the current zoom. Now this is saving the zoom, meaning what I'm seeing, as well as the angle on it. So let's just say this is a 45 degree overall. Um, and I'm saying overall because we're seeing the whole thing, not just that building um, there. And maybe I need to do it across all stories, so it would be available on the upper stories. And then I'll do it a second one that is um, maybe zoomed in on this, and I'll save this as um, 45 degree plot. So this will just be there. Okay. So now if I go to um, previous, if I go to the 45 degree overall, you can see how it jumps out. And of course, if I go to 45 degree plot, then it goes here. And if I um, go back to the home zoom, this is of course where I started the project and these things are off to the side. So we can have as many of these views as, as we want to save by using the save current zoom. Now let's just create the 100 degree uh, one. So again, I'll just say that I'd like to set the orientation graphically that this edge is rotated down here. Now, I'm not sure about your interpretations in terms of, um, in other words, what that is, but this is 100 degrees is now put horizontal. Um, is that sort of what you're, you're talking about? That's fine. It could be a house, there could be a front door on it, and you want the front door to be on the south of the drawing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good enough okay. interpretation. All right, so I'm going to say, uh, and let's just uh, zoom in on this um, just to uh, be a little bit clearer. Um, here and we'll save this current zoom as a um, hundred uh, close up um, here. Okay. All right. So we can now go back and forth between these. And you notice here this is 260. Okay. And if I go to the 45 degree uh, plot, I'm, this is horizontal and now it's at 315. So it'll um, do this. Now I can also um, set orientation. Um, enter rotation center point. That's interesting. Okay, set orientation. Let me just do this arbitrarily. So we can just sort of arbitrarily do it um, as opposed to. So this this seem this seems to be much similar to that. Maybe it's identical even. Um, but let's just go back to uh, one of our um, standard ones. Now, when we have views um, that we uh, use, if I go to um, the, I'm in the view map. We'll go into plans, um, and uh, you know I'll just create um, a new subfolder. Let's see, um, new folder, and we'll just call it um, angled views. There, okay. Um, and let's just save this current view here, um, custom, and we'll say um, 45 uh, plot. There, okay, so when we're saving a view, of course it's gonna save layers and scale and those things, but it'll also save the current zoom. This checkbox is frequently um, ch checked because 
I like it for most things because it allows you to switch between a floor plan and a ceiling plan or a structural plan or other plans and even between one story and another without moving from the area of the building you're in. In other words, you're still looking at the kitchen or you're still looking at the front um, entry, uh, things like that. But in this case, we can't use that. We want to have it include the rotation um, for the current zoom here. And here we can actually choose which zoom we want. So in fact, let's do, this is gonna be um, 45 degree uh, plot here. Okay, so I'll say create that. Um, now we'll go, uh, I'll just of course take one of the other ones here, you know, like the 100 mm -hmm. degree close up and create another one here. Sure. And we'll say um, 100 uh, view. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting some background sound. Is that from your- uh, Possible? Oh. Yeah. That's so, Leaf, all right, so let me, let me meet Leaf. Um, <laughs> Not guilty. Yeah, okay, so I've just um, muted Leaf. He had his microphone still open. All right, so I'm gonna say this is gonna be a current Zoom or it's actually the um, 100 close up there, okay. Um, so now, of course, I can just double click on each of these and uh, it's quickly done. Now let's talk about placing this on a layout sheet. So we're gonna go to a floor plan um, layout sheet um, here. Now let's actually just create a new layout. Um, here and uh, test of angles um, here. Um, okay, and so here I've got a, a sheet and I'm gonna go to these views and I'm gonna drag in 45 plot. All right, now it got the whole thing, right? Um, and not yeah. just the 45 and it's not even rotated um, there. So what went wrong there? You know, like why is it not showing what I expected? Um, well, this um, uh, in when we have a drawing, let's look at the um, drawing default settings here. Um, default settings frame manually resized here. So we want to say fit frame to drawing. This so this is the default for us when we put in a new drawing. Um, here, um, and we also want to say that this um, uh, the settings of that view um, it's zoomed to this here. Um, okay, I think I think this is what we want. So now, if I were to do this again, no, it's still not getting. Um, that because I believe there is an option and I'm trying to remember where it is that when you drag this in it should um, it, it look at that the setting of the view 45 should be horizontal I'm sorry sorry plot 45 should be horizontal yes it should be horizontal and it should be cropped in here yeah okay uh, all right so that's so it's not doing what I expected. So zooming is this here, the one we have, and this would ignore it when we're opening it, but it should use that. I think there's something else. Let me go to options, work environment. Let's see, um, might be under more options. When placing model views, adjust each drawing frame to show only the zoomed area of model views. So this is what I thought it would be. So basically I'm taking a model view, the 45 plot, dragging it onto the layout, adjust the drawing frame to show only the zoomed area of the model view. Um, so that I would think would give, you know, give me the result. Um, so that is not doing it now you know either i misunderstand it or there's something else that's getting in the way or there's a bug like archicad no longer you know <laughs> no longer uses yeah. that um there um it's, so it's, yeah eric it's slightly further on that i find the i can bring them in rotated fine I, i'm not worried about the cropping you can crop that after but it's if you if you were to open up one of those windows now, uh, open mm -hmm. for edit or something like that, right mouse, or you're in a Mac, open source view, right, 
Um, if you were then to change the the rotation, from, let's say 315 to to, to well, that's a 45. You can change the rotate. Okay, then re um, redefine the current settings. So, so you can redefine with current window settings. Well, that's clearly you don't want to ever do that if you exactly. Yeah. yeah so you, that's just um, you, you know, be careful. You almost have to. Yeah. Don't, you almost have to duplicate. Yeah. Don't don't do this. I mean, like after all. You make some more changes, mm -hmm. you, you redesign the building, whatever, um, that's always going to have the latest thing. The only time you need to redefine with current window settings is if you deliberately want to change something about it, whether it's the angle or the zoom or the um, or the layers or something else. Okay, that might be... Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, would, probably... I would never use this for... Uh, well, well, I would be very careful to use it in this context. Now, but let's yeah, look okay. at this, um, this thing here. I think um, the the um, I'm going to go back to the layout sheet because I just want to see uh, if I if sometimes it's not worth bat beating your head against the wall with you know no, when no. ArchiCAD doesn't do something because literally I've had done that for 20 minutes and then somebody said oh I just looked it up it's a known bug you know but um, let me just say fit frame to drawing let me just say manually resized frame. Um, here, so this is now saying that when I drag something in, this is the default settings. It's going to use a yeah. manual resize frame rather than the whole thing. Um, so now, if I bring this in, no, nope, still didn't do that. Of course, I can select this and I can uh, crop it in um, like this. Um, now, inside the drawing, I can. Um, See, we can rotate the whole drawing, but can we rotate the view within the drawing? Um, so this is the view 45. Um, manually resize, which I just did, size and appearance, angle. All right, well, let's just do 45 right now um, here. Um, okay, so it actually went the wrong way, you know, in terms of uh, what we wanted, um, say, you know, minus 45. Oops, interesting. Uh, so let's do 315. Okay, so now it is square, although the, the cropping box is not going to yeah. be, you know, we'd have to move, move the move these around and, and get this. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so um, I've never, I haven't done very much with this, um, what do you call it? Uh, rotated okay. views. Uh -huh. um, certainly, I've done it where you're putting, um, you know, a site plan onto a sheet that's in a different orientation than the the buildings. Um, you know, it yeah. fits long and wide. You know, a certain way. Um, but this is uh, well. Okay. It, it would be nice if it behaved like what we're seeing on the plan, um, and it. It, it doesn't seem to be doing that. So, if okay, I, I think you, anything, I'll let you know. That's yeah. good. Yeah. One okay. more question. Yeah. Could a brief explanation of a worksheet, please? Explanation of a worksheet? Yes, please. Okay. I do, All right. I do a lot of modeling in the model, but I don't use worksheets, and I'm just wondering am I missing a trick? Well, if you're not using worksheets, you're certainly missing an area that's useful in ARCHICAD. So let's talk to everybody, particularly users who have not gotten formal training on, on things, but uh, or relatively new, uh, what all of these pieces are. So in the project map, we have stories, and we all know what stories are in general, in real life and in architecture. Uh, in ARCHICAD, they are levels uh, of elements and mostly they correspond to real world floors of a building but you can have additional stories for you know negative stories for parking and and other things underground you can have extra ones on above or below the real building to put in other 3d things perhaps that you don't show in, in normally but are available you know sometimes people will put a kit of parts down on a negative story um, uh, or uh, uh, or even modules, um, things like a, 
a, a unit that gets repeated a bunch of times can be on a negative story. It's not part of the the actual project, but it's used. It's a copy of it is used within the project. Now sections and elevations, we know you you generally are going to have markers on the plan that will create a section or an elevation. It'll generate it from the model. Interior elevations, we also have markers. It'll generally create those views for different zones or rooms. Now, what are worksheets and what are details? Well, we all know what details are in terms of um, construction practice. You know, they're enlarged drawings showing something of detail. Um, they often are coming directly from the model. You, you know, you mark out something saying, here's the eave, and I'm going to have a bigger drawing of this over on this sheet. Um, and you can, when you create a detail, copy the graphics and then edit it just purely as 2D. So those are details. Well, what are worksheets? Well, worksheets are any other 2D type of um, information that you might want to use. Now, technically, worksheets and details are pretty much the same within ARCHICAD. In other words, they're just a difference in name and a difference in grouping. And my best practices suggestion is that if you call it a detail and you put it on a detail sheet, use the detail tool. If it's something else, use the worksheet tool. So what are typical uses of the worksheet tool? Well, imagine that you have a, um, a, a full section of the building and then you want a wall section that's at a different scale. Well, sometimes people will put that section, copy it from the section into a worksheet and it's sort of like a detail, but it's you don't maybe you don't call it a detail. So you could use it for a wall section. You could use it for um, an enlarged plan. Now, if you had an enlarged kitchen plan or enlarged, um, you know, lobby plan or something like that, you could just say it's at a bigger scale, it's at half inch to a foot or something like that, and put in more annotations. But sometimes you want to be able to actually modify the 3D elements because it's just in, not convenient to model it in such great detail. You want to just muck around with it, make it look the way you need just like any detail drawing. Well, and so you could use that for an enlarged plan of something. You could also use it for a site plan. Again, you can have a live site plan or you can have a site plan that's just came from the plan view, but is now a 2D version of it. So those are all sort of like details that they started from something in the model, but they've been taken out where now you're working on 2D and you're not calling it a detail, you're calling it something else. Another purpose is you can import PDFs or DWG. So let's look at um, in the sample project what we have in terms of worksheets. So here we have one that's an interesting one, company logo. All right, what is this? This is a graphic. This is in master templates, so it's got my company information or the product information. But if you delete this and put in your company information in this area, that shows up on the sheet. So if I look at a title sheet, you can see here's the master template thing. And if I go to the masters, here's that thing. So what is this? This is a view of the worksheet. If I update the worksheet, then every single master will have that updated. Okay, so a worksheet is something that you can put on multiple um, layouts. Uh, we can also have typical notes. Now, there's nothing much in here. Actually, I'm sorry, there are a, a bunch, but you can put a bunch of notes in here. And those notes can either be something that you um, literally place on, um, on a, uh, um, what do you call it, on a layout sheet, or they can be things that you eyedrop. So if I eyedrop this, then I can go and put in a label that has exactly this uh, information. And I, I don't even have to switch to the worksheet to eyedrop it. I can have it as a virtual trace where it's off to the side, and I'm just eyedropping the things that I would like to put in notes. So we can have all sorts of notes here. Now, another thing we can do is we can have um, things that might be um, placed or, or that you might want to eyedrop for sections in elevation. So typically here uh, in we have interactive legend section. Okay. 
Um, so you might want to put in human figures. You might want to put in certain types of uh, dimensional lumber. You might want to put in these are some typical notes that might show up in a section. So when you eye drop these things, you can then place them. So these are all sort of reference materials. Here's another example, detailing library parts. So these are a whole lot of 2D things that you can eye drop and uh, or literally drag and drop from this window into a 2D detail to save time. And many of these are parametric. They are actually in the library, but it's just very quick to go say, oh, I need one of these um, here. Uh, we can also have a site survey. Now, I don't think we have anything in here right now, but you could bring in the DWG into a worksheet. And in fact, that's a very uh, common best practice is instead of bringing the DWG onto a story, put it in a worksheet. And then if you want, you can use trace reference to build the building on the plan with the worksheet showing as a trace behind it. So those are a whole bunch of different things that you can do. Here's another one. Here's here's a legend, you know, that you can um, have. Here's some tips, some things saying, you know, just uh, some notes about stuff um, uh, here. So worksheets can be any type of 2D um, thing that you want. Here's an, even an interesting pen table object um, that I got from somebody in the um, internet a long time ago. Um, you can see all these colors and the line weights. Well, let's go to true line weight. Um, uh, view on screen, true line weight. All right, so you can see the line weights. Now, if I switch my pen set to all black, some gray, you notice how everything switches. It kept the line weights uh, there. If I switch my pen set to electrical plan, we'll see how everything becomes gray in this first row. Um, um, except for pen 10 and then so your basic walls and columns and, and things will become gray but other ones will change so this is you know just a reference for um, uh, for viewing things so these are all worksheets they're all many different ways that you could potentially um, use that uh, here's a, a demo legend so you know you can just put a legend here now why would you do it here rather than on the plan well, you might actually place this on the plan and then copy it into a worksheet and then this worksheet can be placed on multiple sheets right um, any type of a legend um, or uh, notes like floor plan keynotes you could have a whole group of notes that are going to be put onto the plans and you do it in a worksheet and then put them onto multiple sheets so by the way these are all set up in master template for convenience as placeholders so that you can add your stuff. You can do this in your own project. There's nothing sacred about it other than the fact that this, you know, it's just got a lot of stuff already preset. So how's that? Sounds good, Derek. Many thanks. You're welcome. So- um, Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, let's then move on and see if there's any other questions. So, uh, okay, so Lawrence. Um, okay, so you're talking about the Text expander does work inside Archicad. Um, yep, okay. And Doug Muir, hey Doug, um, had this Zoom rotate link break occasionally as well um, there. So uh, I guess I'm not the only one to experience that. And then you wrote down schedules and partition types. So uh, are you referring to um, just ways that you use worksheets um, there or something else? And Dave Olaf says, I uh, love worksheets. Okay, so you're using it a lot. Okay, so I'm gonna go and say, I've at least given you what I could there. All right, so let's see. Um, so Mark, I know we were looking here, let me just check these. Kent, Kent Smith, nope. Um, Lennox, nope. Paul King. Nope. Okay, Mark Wilson. Nope. Okay, so Mihail. Mihail. Nope. Jamshade. Jamshade. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. You are there. Now I know that this question I did I did resolve this for you. So let me hold on to this because 
um, if one of these other people is on, then I want to answer it. I know I gave you a good answer um, just yesterday, I think. Um, so we'll hold on there. Let's see, Eric Milberger. Um, no. Um, and James Coy. Um, no, everybody. So we're down to 75 people. So, you know, some of these people may have been on earlier and gave up. So I apologize, uh, but let's uh, let's look at Jam Shades one because it was a, a actually sort of related a little bit to um, this question of bringing in a drawing with the right angle and stuff like that. So let me bring up your line, Jam Shade, um, and your question. So Jam, Jam Shade, I've got your line open. Do you have a microphone? And are you near your desk? Okay. Well, I'm um, gonna do this. Just let me know if you're um, if you're there. But you might have he might have stepped away. Um, so, question is: uh, When I place a detail on a sheet, it gets placed on a 45 degree angle, and the detail is all blank, and it appears bigger than the detail viewport. And I gave him some explanations. Instead of reading this to you, I'm just going to demonstrate uh, what I shared because this I've seen this many times get in the way of people um, uh, with this. So uh, let's see. I have um, a let's go to actually we'll go to a detail drawing. So architectural details. This sample project doesn't have many real details. This is a pretty good detail from the actual project, and this one is just an example foundation footing one. Um, but let's just say that I wanted to bring in um, a detail uh, here. Um, so we have, uh, go to our detail drawings. Um, okay, and example foundation detail. So this is the one I've got. Um, all right, is this one here? Let me just drag this in. Okay, so it's example foundation detail. It's, uh, it is probably the same drawing as that. Now we can see that it came in horizontally in a normal orientation and that immediately we're seeing the boundaries of everything um, here. Uh, you know, so that's no problem. Now, um, let's say, um, let me just delete this. Um, let's say that for some reason I was bringing in the site plan. So we'll go to we have a site roof survey. Okay, so I don't know, here's a, a site plan of this particular one. Um, let's say that the, um, the site plan I needed to, for some reason, be at 45 degrees, or let's do it uh, maybe a little different. I'll just rotate it um, 30 degrees. Um, I'm there, and I'll drag this down. Now, um, so I've done this for whatever good reason I wanted. Now, if I use the eyedropper here, what did that do? It will pick up the settings of this particular um, uh, drawing and load it in so that the next time I put it in a drawing, it'll use those settings. So what are some of the things that can happen? Well, um, in this case, it's saying it'll use the name of the view, in this case, site plan, but sometimes it may have a custom name and it may say, let's just go here and say um, uh, uh, custom name example. All right, so when, when we've placed something on a sheet, we might give it a new name. That's fine. You just say custom and give it a new name and it'll show up in the, um, what do you call it, uh, the title uh, there. But if you eyedrop it, of course, it's going to lock in on that. Now, we also can see here's the angle 30 degrees. And let's just go to um, frame and say manually resize frame um, here. Okay. So what this is um uh, doing and, and so this is an example of defaults that are not going to be helpful it's got a fixed name so every drawing i put in from here on will have that name it will have a manually resized frame so it'll ignore the size that of the drawing um and uh what else um those two things um and i have something else here oh and the angle the 30 degrees okay so what that means is, let me go now to back to that um, detail sheet and go and drag in a detail like this one. 
you can see it's at 30 degrees. You can see that it has the wrong name. And well, in this case, it did uh, pull the size um, there. But uh, what his question was, um, I drag this into a sheet, it gets placed on an angle. That's because his default settings for the drawing tool was set at 45, probably because I dropped something um, uh, that had that angle. The detail is all blank and it appears bigger than the detail viewport. Well, let's just see what that could be. Um, so if um, we have, when we have a drawing in, in a frame, and there, there'll always be a boundary of frame here, uh, we can go and press down in the center and say, I want to move the contents of the drawing. So I can tweak it, I can adjust it. And of course, I'm cropping this here. I could actually take it off. So right now, you can see that this particular um, uh, drawing exists, but I'm not seeing the contents of it. Um, and if you had eye dropped something that had a specific frame um, here, um, and we can you know, crop this in. So we had a specific um, frame size. Then when we place in, so let me actually just um, uh, eye drop this and I'll just get rid of this again. Now let me just drag that detail in and we'll see what happens. I drag it in. Um, okay, so it did have crop to frame, fit frame to drawing. Okay, so in any event, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's causing his thing where it's um, uh, it, it is off screen. But if if you have this placed off to the side, then you know you can have this drawing here, whether it's at a, a 40, uh, you know, an angle like 30 degrees. Uh, where's our angle um, here? Let's put it at zero. Whether it's horizontal or not, um, you know, you can say I placed it, but it's empty. So the solution here is either to manually go and you know open this up until you find it, and sometimes it can be hard, but um, an update to frame here. So now there's that, or you can use the option. Uh, the simplest one is to go in and say, I want to fit frame to drawing, and now we'll fit all to frame, and you can see it moved around to be able to show the drawing. Um, now sometimes this may be off screen. In other words, you place the frame down here, but the actual contents is up in the, you know, off the, the layout. So when you say fit frame to drawing, it might actually jump off the layout and then you just have to drag it in. But those are a couple of things that I explained to Jamshade um, there. And uh, I hope you found that at least uh, potentially useful if you run into issues like that, where you're placing a drawing onto a sheet and it's not giving you you know, a, a good um, a good view at the beginning. Um, so let's see. Hi, Eric. Hey, you're, um, so you've- uh, Yeah, my microphone was off, sorry. Okay, um, so thanks for sending this in. Um, uh, did you catch my live explanation there? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Now, even when like uh, the solution that you uh, just showed, uh, I'm following that and it works fine. But even uh, now that I've eye dropped that detail, everything like there's no angle, but still it shows blank until I do that toggle, um, the one you showed. Okay, well, um, I, when you eye drop it, I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, again, it may be one of these subtle things that even I am misunderstanding. But if I, um, if I eye drop this here, um, and now I look at the default settings. So now I'm in the drawing default settings here, fit frame to drawing. This is the one that you know generally yes. you want to use um, for the default. And it shouldn't okay. when you drag something in it. If you have it set as fit frame to drawing, it should um, you know place it uh, in a sensible way where you're seeing the contents of the drawing right away. Yeah, um, I think my um, my default is manually resize frame. Yeah, so you want to change the default to fit frame to drawing. That's okay. that's a, usually a much better default, as well as instead of a custom name, you usually the the most common thing, 95% of the time, you want to say that when I drag in a drawing, it should use the name from the view map so that 
you know it it has it has a name rather than something that was set manually for something else now just one question here like how do you set the default for all the drawings that you are bringing them in okay this is the default it'll use that until you change the default okay and how is how are you getting this uh, uh i'm in the, i'm in the drawing tool here so okay. if i switch to the line tool i'm looking at line settings if we were in the plan you know how you say hey i want to put in a certain wall let me go switch go to the wall tool uh, i need this type of wall you pick the wall tool this is the default for the next wall you draw and it'll keep drawing more and more walls like that until you change the default okay okay got it so that's the definition of default is the settings used for the next time you place an element and archicad in general doesn't change those settings unless you eye drop or manually tweak them okay perfect thank you you're welcome all right so uh where are we at now um so jam shade we've done this here um so we had a few others that were sent in. People seem to have um, either they didn't make it to the call or they came and had to leave. Uh, so uh, let me see if there's other ones, because I can't always say, hey, Lennox, watch the call as of the three hour mark, you know, uh, here. So um, if any of you who are um, uh, in this group um, have, shown up let me know um and then if uh uh what am i going to say if there are any of you who are on the call who didn't send in a question but you have a question for me uh, certainly i'd be happy to take them um so i'll keep monitoring the the chat area so um this one for kent i think i'd have to see the file because i don't know what's going on and, and it really wouldn't make sense to to explore things without him saying oh that's what i was doing um lennox is a little different uh, while i don't know the exact um question uh, context i will bring it up and just explain a, a few things um here is there a way to convert an entire set of autocad drawings from metric to imperial feet and inches okay so this brings up the question of what makes a drawing or a model in a particular unit system. Now, if you think about the uh, real world, the real world um, has no units. You know, it's as wide as your arms. It's as long as your foot. It's from, you know, it's as long as this yardstick, right? Okay, the real world is just, you know, it is what it is, okay? Now we divide it into a measurement unit, whether it's you know feet and inches or metric or you know some other uh, microscopic thing, you know, uh, or uh, something for the astronomy. Um, now Archicad basically internally keeps track of everything metrically, so I believe that their internal um, uh, accuracy is down to the millimeter. It might be even less than a millimeter. I don't know, um, but it speaks your language so even though it's made in hungary it speaks english it speaks you know many other languages uh there so in terms of something being 30 feet long well 30 feet is not quite 10 meters uh you know nine meters something um here well if i wanted to dimension this say let's say i was designing this and then it was it was going to be built in europe um or even canada perhaps uh, uh you know I, and i wanted the dimensions to show in metric that's ah, easy enough all i have to do is go into the dimension settings here all right so right now you can see this option here that says amt condox so this is archive master template construction documents let me just switch it to plain meter so there we have it's in metric or maybe i want it to be in plain millimeter Okay, so it changes the period to a comma um, there. Um, now, if I'm in different scales in, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, even in feet and inches, um, I can say building scale. It's going to uh, round this to a certain level. If I go to enlarge scale, well, these are actually all 
um, carefully done in nice, nice even units. But let me just draw um, a wall um, here, sort of an arbitrary, um, you know. So I'm just doing it an arbitrary length, and let's dimension it from here to here. All right, that says seven foot five. Now it's not really seven foot five. Um, it is something else. If I go to AMT Condox, that's weird, because this certainly wasn't seven foot five. If I measure this, um, oh, where's my measure tool? If I measure this, seven foot five in a 30 second. Well, it happens to be very close to that. Uh, let me just make this um, uh, just sort of some other thing here. Here's eight foot seven and an eighth. All right. Now, um, if I go to uh, enlarge scale, um, or uh, let's see, mill work and details. Well, mill work and details is changing it to showing a number of inches, you know, 103 inches there. Um, but we might have site survey. This is now 8.595 feet. So all of these things are set up in your project preferences dimensions. And, you know, it basically is saying, how do you want this to be reported? And so we have all of these different options here. So these are presets that you can activate at any time. So in the simple case from what um, Lennox is asking about, how do you switch a drawing from metric to imperial? The answer is you don't switch the drawing, you simply switch the dimension preferences to your preferred unit. So if he likes working in feet and inches, even though he's in uh, somewhere in Grenada, um, you know, I don't know, Grenada, Grenada may uh, think Grenada is um, a, Brit a former British colony. So, you know, it might might still have people constructing in feet and inches, or maybe he grew up with that, I don't know. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, you can just switch this to whatever you need. Now, in addition, when I'm drawing something, uh, let's see if I'm uh, going to the wall tool. What is it feeding up, uh, feeding me? It's saying distance is five foot, you know, whatever. Well, if I go to the options, project preferences, working units, I can switch and say, let me work in, uh, say, millimeters. Okay, so now as I'm drawing this, you can see it's showing me the millimeter um, length. So drawing units is the feedback that we see in the tracker, as well as dialog boxes like. Now here we have the 10 foot height is now 3,048 millimeters um, there. And of course I could say, oh no, 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 I want it to be 3,000 or 2,950 or some nice even metric number, uh, of course. Um, but the dimensions are what you see on a drawing. The measurement, the, it's, is it working units? No, I'm forgetting. Um, it's working units. Um, that are what you're seeing in the dialog boxes. And they interact, and you normally have them both in s similar ways, but um, you know, we're not converting the project, we're simply converting the annotation for the project. Um, so I think that's uh, what we need to keep in mind here. All right, so um, that was uh, 4.05 to 4.11, so about you know, five or six minutes, I think. Um, so I'm going to make a note about that and tell Lennox that that's where I explained it. Um, uh, explained um, at 4.05 p.m. for about five minutes. Um, so there we go. Now, by the way, if you're importing, um, the other thing that I just realized uh, can be important, when you're importing a DWG, there is something that determines the size of the elements. So let me just finish this here, um, put it down. Um, so if I am importing a DWG, so I don't know that I have a DWG handy, but if we go to um, place an external drawing, whether I do this in the plan or I do it in a worksheet, and I pick something like DWG, there is, um, and of course, I guess I have to find something. I don't know, let me see if I have DWG. Um, name matches DWG. 
uh, okay, so here's here's something. Um, so when I open this, it says, what is the drawing unit? So working units are different than drawing units. So in AutoCAD, PWG, in the US, most architectural drawings are done in feet and inches, and the drawing unit inside AutoCAD is most commonly an inch. So if you say that something's two feet six inches, that's 30 inches, and it would AutoCAD would internally say, oh, this is 30 units long, 30 drawing units long. Um, now, if you're working with a surveyor, they often are doing decimal feet. So, you know, the property is 85.238 feet long, you know, on this side. Um, so then um, the uh, drawing unit, when you're bringing it in, might be a foot. Now, if you're working with um, in metric, then some drawings may come in as millimeters, some as meters with decimal points, et cetera. Uh, so by choosing the drawing unit properly, when you bring in the PWG, when you measure things, things will look correct. If, you're, if you've got it wrong, it'll generally be off by a fixed factor. In other words, if you choose a foot, it, when it should be an inch, things will be 12 times as big uh, or vice versa. Um, so generally, when, I, when, when, uh, people recommend, when people import a DWG, I say the first thing you should do is just measure something known, like the size of a doorway or bathtub or possibly something that's dimensioned on screen, and you can see it says that it's supposed to be this length, and you measure that. And it won't be off by just a hair. It'll either be perfect, or it'll be um, uh, off by some factor of 12 or 10, or something like that. So that's another thing that is about conversion um, that may be important for um, Linux as well as um, others there. Okay, so. I'm going to uh, leave that ticket open because I need to just respond and let him know that uh, that's done. Um, so let me just close this guy here, which we answered. Um, so Conrado had a question, interesting, and James. Um, all right, so he was sending these things in, but he didn't show up. Um, Luis... Uh, I sent you the link and I think you did show up. Um, yeah, you are on the call, that's good. Um, and I know that uh, Joseph here never received a link to join. Well, you did, uh, Did he He did get it because we worked with him back a ways. And Caitlin, um, all right, so we did do answer her question. So we close that. Okay, um, so I do have a few more questions that I had uh, cataloged. Um, so this is a marathon. Um, and uh, those of you who are still on, 62 of you, um, thank you. You are dedicated, and obviously so am I. Um, okay. Uh, so this one from Mihail, I don't know a whole lot about interoperability with Revit. I mean, I've can answer some questions, but I think the question was about how do you optimize it, and I don't really have a good explanation. Um, this one is an interesting one we can try. Um, okay, so let's go to Mark Wilson's question. Um, and Okay, so this goes back to a tip that I had shared via video, you know, as one of my tutorials. Um, and it, in general, it works, and it's a time saver. But um, it there can be some subtleties, and it's even possible that there's been some bugs in ARCHICAD, not, you know, so it doesn't do what you want. Um, he also has a separate question about polylines here. So let's just see those two things. So this is Mark for Mark Wilson, who I believe is not on the call right now. Nope. Uh, I'm not sure if he showed up at all. Um, okay, so Mark here. All right, so we can see um, on the plan here, we've got Windows, um, and right now we've got a window 5566. Five, six. Now, of course, we might want to have them because maybe these two windows are identical and these two are, um, you know, a different size. So we want to group them and say win window 5 is 
a particular size and we have three of them and Windows 6, you know, so many. But obviously another way to do that is to say this is five, six, seven, eight, or some other numbering uh, like that. When you do that, of course, you may not be placing the windows in your model in the order that you want them to end up being scheduled. So typically I say, don't don't worry about the numbers until later when you're about to get, uh, work on your schedules, then go number them. Um, now I could go in here and select uh, this uh, W05, and let's just say that I wanted to call it W03. Now I'm deliberately not using one, just because I want to say, what if I want to start at a different number because I've already got some numbered in some areas? So I'll just say three. Well, you can see as soon as I change that, it, it, it updates. Well, let's say now I want this to be four, five, six um, uh, in numbers. Well, what I can do is I can select them in that order. So I select this one, the next one, and the next one. So this is five, six, six, and I want it to be four, five, six. Okay. So I go to the document menu. I go to um, it's uh, what is it? Listing extras, element ID manager. So the ID of these windows is what we're talking about. These windows are elements. So we're we're managing the ID of these elements. Um, now it is set for window. We might need to adjust that to make sure it's matching. We'll need to set the ID format here. You can see this has three um, letters or three numbers and it says this is a preview. I'm going to say, no, I want it to be a W dash. I'm sorry, just W. And it's only going to be one character here. And then it's going to be just um, two characters here um, like that. Um, and then I might want to say that it starts with what uh, three, say four. Okay. So it's going to be two characters. It's going to start with W04. And I also need to make sure that um, I want to have a unique ID for each element. So even though some windows might be the same uh, in all aspects, I just want to give them a unique ID. So now I'm saying renumber them starting at W04 using this system here. And maybe we say this is not used and not used. I'm not sure if that's um, necessary to, to say that. But uh, what if I say change IDs? It says, oh, you have a four, five, and a six. And there it is, four, five, six. Well, let's just see if it goes in the opposite direction. Okay, so I'm going to take this one. So we'll do that, and we'll go counterclockwise, and we'll say starting it at 11, um, and we'll go even, we'll go around to here. All right. So I'll go into the document um, listing extras, element ID manager, and we'll say that it's going to be unique IDs for Windows. The ID format is going to be W two digits. We're going to start at 11. Um, here, um, and I just say change IDs. We have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay. And well, isn't that interesting? It has 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It went the opposite direction from what I, um, I, I selected them in that order. Wow. That's odd. In fact, actually, here's 15, yeah, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. Um, so that's odd. All right. Well, let's try doing it the reverse way. Um, I don't know why that would be. So that is odd because it's the reverse of what I just had. So I, I, let's say I want that to be 11 for whatever reason. Um, and document, uh, listening extras element ID manager. Uh, so it's, um, Nick ID here, um, 11, or let's just, let's just do it as, you know, 21 just to see. Um, so it's going to go 21 through whatever, change IDs. Okay, it says that it's doing that. And it's still going clockwise. Okay, so that is odd. And of course, um, what if I did it in some arbitrary thing? I'd say uh, this one, um, then that one, then this one. So uh, it's not behaving quite right. It should be the order that you selected as far as I know. So we'll again do one more thing and see if, if I can get this element ID manager and we'll say that it's going to be ID format. And let me just start at um, 31 here. And remember that I did, uh, I don't know, 
what did I do? I think this one first, then that one, then that one. Um, let's say change IDs. So here, 31, 32, 33. So it's actually doing some, it's renumbering them and it's ignoring the ones that I didn't have selected, but it, it is doing it in some, well, you could call it a sensible manner, <laughs> um, but it's not doing it in the order that I had selected it, which is what it, what I always believed it did. And maybe I was taught that incorrectly. Let me just see if there's some preference, project preferences here. Uh, or sorry, work environment. So there is something here for um, selection and element information here. No, it's uh, not that. Um, not that. So more options. Okay, here's one, L assign new element ID to each element. That is what normally when you just place in another window and another window and another window, it just increments and you can turn that off. But I don't see anything that says um, that it's gonna do it in some arbitrary clockwise way. Um, uh, and that would be the only thing I know of that's about ID. So, um, so I'll have to agree with um, uh, that. Now I'm looking, Rob Harrison says, what about sort in the element ID manager? Um, okay, and then uh, Tom Palmer, you said, uh, did I record this? You got distracted, missed some topics. Uh, yes, it is being recorded. So uh, all, you know, if the tech gods are good, you know, it'll all be available. Um, but Rob Harrison says, what about sort in the element ID manager? Well, let's just see. So I want to go backwards. So I'm going to say here's, um, you know, I'm going in this particular order. Again, this is my first one here. We'll go to the document listing extras element ID manage uh, option. Now sort elements here. Unique ID is what I want. That absolutely has to be that um, that case because it's uh, set same ID by criteria is not um, what we want. We don't want, we don't want to have anything that's the exact same type of window have mul have the same number. Um, so that's sorting it now. I don't know. Is there anything elevation? We're not sorting it here. So this is element ID. What if I remove this? Oh well, there's an interesting thing. So that might be looking at, at the pre-existing sort. Okay, so it's gonna be unique and it's not gonna be looking, it's not gonna be sorting to put it in. It's gonna potentially do it based on the um, my selection order. And here we'll say, let's uh, do this uh, 61, just to be arbitrary and say change IDs. It'll say 61, two, three, and there we go. Bingo, so thank you, Rob. Um, you told me to look in a certain place and that's where it was. I didn't realize that if you have element ID in the sort column, that it will number it based on that. And of course, hey, we wanna renumber these. And it's basically was saying, you know what, I'm gonna take the lowest ID and number that first, then second, then third. So because I had done clockwise initially, it locked that into um, that or you know that sequence. Um, so if you want to do it purely by select one, then the next, then the next, then um, just leave out that element ID in the uh, listing. So I learned something today, and now I have a good answer for Mark's question. Now he had another question which had to do with polylines. So, you know, we have the line tool, and of course I can create a line and another line and another line. Now, these lines are separate, although I can select all three of them, and I can go to the edit menu and group them. So now if I select one of them, it's um, uh, and if I have groups active, then it selects them. So that are a series of lines. Now, the other thing is called a polyline, and I'll do something similar. Okay, and now when I select this, it's one element, and you can see it's slightly different looking than these, because this is three elements, three lines, and one polyline. 
Now, there are some things in ARCHICAD that will only work with the Lime tool. Um, in other words, if you are, I think one thing is when you create a custom line type and you're copying some um, something that is already a set of lines into it, it only works with lines. There may be a few other places where lines work and polylines don't. So there is an option um, here where I can select these guys. Now there's three of them and I can use the edit menu, reshape, unify, and that will take these three, I think, um, into, let's see this, let me suspend groups. I think I have to have, maybe I have to have groups suspended in this case. So these are three and we should be able to go edit, reshape, unify, and now this is a single polyline. Okay, so that's the opposite of what he wants. What he wanted um, is, is I, I'm trying to explode this into a series of lines. So this is one element, and I'll go to the edit menu, reshape, and instead of unify, I'll explode into current view. It says keep original elements after exploding. No, because I, I just want the lines. I don't want the polyline plus the lines. So I'll say okay. All right, now I have three separate elements, but what type of element is this? It is a polyline. So even though it's a separate piece, it is not considered a line. I think in the old days, or I don't know, a while when I first learned this, because they added unify um, as a command, you know, maybe back in Arcad 8 or 10 or something like that. Um, I believe it would explode it into lines. Now it explodes it into multiple polylines, which doesn't really help in this case. So what would I do um, here? So let me undo this. So he, uh, here's a, a polyline. I'm going to go to the line tool, and let's just give this a different color. I'll take it, change it from red to blue, and I'm going to use the magic wand. So I'm holding down the space bar. I'm going to click on um, this. I'm getting a, a spinning ball, but here you can see it's pre, the pre-selection highlight is showing. You, I'm going to trace this sequence here, a click, and now I don't see much of a difference, but now if I select, what is this? This is a line. Now, there, it's still showing red. Why? Because there is a polyline and a set of three lines. So if I go to the polyline tool and I hold down the shift key, and hover over it, you can see this is a polyline. Let me just drag this out of the way. So here's the polyline that I traced. Here's the three separate lines. Each one of these is a line as opposed to a polyline. So again, if I select this and I explode it, unfortunately, and for certain things, when I explode it here, um, this is a polyline as opposed to a line. So in the rare case where that matters, um, then the best thing I've come up with is to eye drop, I'm sorry, you, a magic wand with the line tool, and it will then create a series of lines, possibly with arcs, because you can, when it magic wands it, if there's a curved segment, it'll um, do arcs as well. So that's the answer to Mark's question. And his comment of, I used to be able to explode a polyline into basic line format, but not now. And so the answer is you can magic wand to do it and then get rid of the polyline. That's at least that's the only way I know of. And you'd have to do it for each one of those because previously you could select a bunch of polylines and explode them and they would all become lines. Now you'd have to magic wand each of them and then of course delete the polylines. Um, all right, so that answers his question. Um, and I think those those are important tips. Um, okay, so Doug Muir, you wrote, I drop it. I think you meant the same as what I said, uh, or maybe you were saying, why did you say I drop it? What do you mean? Um, so when you I drop something, you are picking up the settings to draw a new um, element. Uh, when you magic wand, you're telling our cat to trace with the currently active drawing tool over something that it recognizes like a series of lines. Now, so for example, if I go to the wall tool, 
and I magic wand, um, if I if I magic wand this, then I'm basically telling it to draw walls. Um, let's see, interesting. So it should magic wand here. It seems I'm getting a spinning ball, so my my computer may be slowing down. But you can see when I click on it, um, it's now created a series of of uh, walls tracing the reference line there. Um, so that's magic wand as opposed to eye drop. When I hold down the option key, I can say I eye drop this and it's going to switch from the wall tool to the line tool or switch to the wall tool. So that's the eyedropper there um, as opposed to the magic wand. Um, and is the magic wand in the toolbar, toolbox? Uh, might be somewhere. I don't see it. Uh, so it, we're talking about holding down the space bar to activate the magic wand, and then Arcad will be looking to see if you've got something that is a series of lines um, that you want to trace, a, ser a series of lines or arcs or a polygon. Um, okay. So, and Doug says inject new values. So that's the syringe. Um, so uh, let's just see, can we do this? This is a polyline. I'm going to reshape, explode into current view, keep original elements after, no, I'll say no. All right, we now have um, a series of polylines. Can I, I drop this. Now I'm setting the line tool. Can I inject it into here? What happened? It's still a polyline, but you may have noticed that it turned blue. Okay, so the inject works on some level to say, I would like to make it the same color, the same layer, but it won't change the element type. It won't say change this polyline to a line, but good try, good try. Um, and that is the syringe key, which is um, command option or control alt or using this little icon. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so, Terrence says, another possibility is to use reshape line consolidation to convert a polyline to a bunch of lines. Interesting. Well, let's see. Let's see how that works. All right, so let me go back in here. Let me undo back. All right, so now this is a polyline um, here. Um, and uh, Let's just do one that's a um, a curve, you know, something like that. There. So this is actually one element just with a series of node points and either straight or curved segments in between. So if I select this, there is an option under the Edit menu, Reshape, Line Work Consolidation. So Line Work Consolidation allows you to convert things. Oh, convert polylines into lines and arcs. Interesting. Okay. So let's try that. I'll just say, okay, there's nothing that's merging. There's no no overlapping things. So I'm just going to say, go ahead and do it. Um, and now what do I have here? I have lines. Bingo! Taryn, you get a big gold star here. Um, uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so awesome. I didn't realize that that was there. You know, this is why I teach because it's the only way I learn anything. All right. So um, that is that is great. Okay. So uh, that's an even that's a much better solution than magic wanding it and deleting the the um, uh, deleting the polylines because you could select multiple polylines. You could select a whole drawing full of them and turn them all into simple lines. So, okay. Um, so um, that one here, Mark Wilson. So put that down. We've down to almost the end here. Um, so the wall cleanup, 
I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to have to do that separately. I mean, it's 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 a project that he sent me. Um, at least we were having problems getting it, and I I know it's going to be a very specific thing for how walls are connected to each other, and I think it'll it's not of general it's not as general interest as other things. Um, but this one, Paul King, I wish he was on here because it is um, it is an interesting. Um, question and it would be good to discuss it, but I can at least do a little bit here, particularly this filtering ones. Okay, so uh, let me bring up his question and then we can look at that. And by the way, if any anyone from the coaching program wants to ask a question, um, you know, feel free to drop it in. We'll finish up within the next 20 minutes. I promise I won't go past five. Um, all right, so Paul King. Um, so he's saying, how do we apply a renovation status to an entire module um, without opening and redefining elements within the source file? So basically, if you were to bring in a, um, a room design or a building as a whole or a, a floor plate, from an external file as a hot-linked module, um, a, can you designate that entire thing as new compared to existing? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know that you can do that, but there may be another alternative that actually um, uh, gives just as much control as what you're looking for, Paul. Um, so I'm going to look at that is how do we efficiently and graphically detect and communicate collisions or clashes between one or more provided IFC files and an ARCAD file they're referenced into without resorting to expensive third-party software? This is something I haven't done much of, but there are so there's some built-in options for collision detection in late versions of ARCAD. Rather than try to stumble through this, particularly since Paul is not here, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but I will maybe brush up on my... Um, on what I uh, know and then give him an answer. But this one I'm going to show because um, he's essentially saying, how do we efficiently define multi-story apartment mod modules containing windows and doors within a host master file, leaving the module source elements in the master file for speed of editing and updating without those doors and windows being included in the door and window schedule? So I'm not 100% sure from the description, but I believe if we had you know, something that is brought in, and let's say we have a um, uh, you know three unit types, and we're repeating them you know a certain number of times each, and we don't want those unit types to be showing up um, in the in your overall schedule. Um, you want them to be only in the separate uh, separate project files. Uh, at least that's what I think might be what you're trying to filter. So let me just um, say how do we how do we deal with filtering? Um, stuff. Okay. Uh, so to demonstrate this, I'm going to say here is the project that we've been looking at. And let's get rid of this um, here. And this project has some schedules. So if I go to the um, in the schedules, um, uh, uh, it's going here. Let's see. We'll do a schedule for um this one here okay so there it says there are 11 doors actually let me go to the one that's for windows um here so we have window schedule standard all right so we were just dealing with this and you can see the number 61 62 63 so this is live it's showing what's in the model the ones that say wn are some uh, ones in one area on the floor plan where it's officially it's it's a new segment of the pro project, so these are new windows as opposed to existing. Anyway, it is showing just those windows. Um, now, if we were to go in here to the scheme settings and add in one field, which would be quantity, um, there, and we'll just put it up um, here, we'll see that there's just one, and maybe I'll just say um, uh, number here. Okay. All right. Um, so not that that's particularly useful, but I wanted to show you that this is showing only what's in the project and it's not showing some stuff that's off to the side of the project. 
So there is a, um, uh, uh, there are some series of filters here in any schedule. First of all, what are we listing? We're listing window types. I mean, you could say I'm listing just wi um, just uh, windows. That would exclude windows and curtain walls. Um, I think that's the main difference is window types would include windows within curtain walls. Um, we're also excluding things that are just a cutout in the wall um, that might be used with the window tool with the empty window or the simple window opening. These are two library part names that are used in some versions of ARCHICAD for a window opening that really doesn't have a window in it. It's not framed. It's just simply a cutout. So we don't want to list those. Um, and we're now saying that the ID starts with W. Now this is key because there are some other windows that actually are in this project file that don't start with W and it's not going to show them. Now, why would I have windows that don't start with W? Well, because in this case, I they are coming in from a hot link. They are from outside the file, and that's what Paul was asking about. When you have things that come in from outside, do you if you don't want them to be scheduled, how do you eliminate them? Because other, you know, without any exclusion, it'll just list everything there. So let's look at what else is actually in this project. So those of you who use Master Template or have seen my demonstrations may know that off to the side of this building is a whole set of tools or elements um, here. Um, now, why am I not seeing them? Because there's some layers that are hidden, including this one called Master Module Legend. I turn that on here, either manually or by using a layer combination called Interactive Legends, then the elements that are in that hot link will show. So I'm going to say, okay, let's um, uh, do that. Now, I don't see much difference here. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I changed my layer combination. Um, so actually, let's, let's just go back to the floor plan layer combination so it looks normal, and then just change the one layer, the master module legend. So that's the only change. We don't see any change um, here, but if I now fit in window, Interesting. Why am I not seeing the the layers? Master module legend. Somehow I didn't change that. Okay, there it is. They, okay. Um, and now fit in window. What is going on here? I'm on. I'm on the first floor. Hmm. Okay, there's something going on. I'm gonna uh, getting a little tired here, but let's go to the um, maybe because of, I'm in a saved view. But let me go to the Legends favorites here and Legends plan here. All right. All right. So now I'm turning on a bunch of um, layers that allow the legend to show up. So what is the legend? In this case, it's a kit of parts. So if I zoom in on it, we'll see um, these are different types of walls, and I can eye drop them um, and uh, you know be able to put in walls of different types, different types of floors um, that I can eye drop here. These are sort of a, a little view of the section of it. Um, we have all sorts of elements here that we can eye drop, um, line types, um, you know, uh, different uh, element types, etc. Um, so this is all off to the side, and if I fit in window right now, you'll see that that group of elements that I was just looking at is off away from the building. Here's the building we were just looking at. And what I want to point out is if I say go to the window tool and I say select all windows, you can see that there's a whole bunch that highlighted here as well as some there. It says there are 38 of them. Only 11 of them are editable. So what does that mean? It means that there are 38 in there, but 11 of them are on layers that are unlocked and are actually native to this file as opposed to being hot linked. So the ones in this area on the right are hot linked in. And remember, I just I had to turn on a layer to be able to um, see this. Now let's go and, and, and look a little bit more what we've got here. Um, so if I have groups, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, if I have 
um, if I have groups active and I select any element here, you'll see it selects the whole thing. This is what's linked in. And when I look at the, uh, when I right click, I can say, what are the settings of this hot link? And it says, well, anything that you look in here uh, is going to have an ID that starts with AMT legend. So basically, this is the master ID for this particular hot link. And if I were to um, turn suspend groups and select this window, um, actually select this window here, then um, what do I have? Its ID is AMT legend w, W01. So in other words, even though the window is W01, the overall ID starts with the, this hot link module. So when we bring in a module, we have the opportunity to give it a master um, layer name, a master uh, name, master hot link master name. What is it called? Um, uh, let's see if I select this again with groups on and go to hot link selection settings. It is the master ID. So it's the master ID. So we have that. Now, so these windows um, here are not showing in the schedule. Why? because in that schedule, let me go back to that schedule, um, there are not 38 of them there. It's because the hot link and element ID does not start with W, it starts with AMT legend and then W. So this is a filter that says, even though the window itself has an ID of W01, the hot link and element ID combination doesn't start with W, so it's going to be excluded from the schedule. So that's the answer for um, for Paul saying, uh, you know, how do we have these windows and doors in there without the doors and windows being included in the door and window schedules? And that is, you have to have a filter that ex that is based at least in part on um, whether it's from a hot link. Another exclusion could be. Um, I think there's um, another way that you can do it um, is to add a criteria and we can say um, hotlink and say is hotlink module. Um, you're saying I want to list windows that are not in a hotlink. So that would be another way to, to simply say, you know what, if it's hot LinkedIn, I don't want this schedule to show me. I don't, you know, so it's not looking at the W, it's just that it's not part of a hot link. Um, and, uh, uh, but of course, the reason why, or not, of course, the reason why I have this W thing uh, here is this allows us potentially to list windows if you make the hot link ID, master ID, start with W. Um, you know, you can set a criteria that will include some hot links, but not others. This one would be blanket um, here. Uh, so those would be the two ways to do it, either to exclude it if it's a hot link or to have it only looks for something that starts with a W and have a master ID that um, is, uh, um, you know, does not start with a W. Um, so I think uh, the... Um, other thing, I'm just going to see if we have an option um, for changing the renovation status of something. So if I, uh, I don't think we do, but let's just see if I have groups active, select this. So I've got all of this stuff selected, um, you know, the 8,090 things here. Um, now, if I go to um, uh, edit selection set, Right now, these are not editable, but it's basically saying there's a whole bunch of walls, columns, beams, etc. All of these things. What can I do? I can change them um, with a layer. I could put a bunch of things I've selected onto a layer. I could change their color, um, but I can't change. There's nothing here that allows me to change their renovation filter status. If I go to a, um, if I open up the uh, renovation, let's see, it's, um, this is the renovation filter here. Can I change? this from existing to new status, it blinked as if it was thinking about it, but now it's not uh, changing it. So I don't think we can do that for a, a module. So 
The other thing that um, we can do that would relate to Paul's question, since he's saying, hey, you know, this is something's new versus existing, is you could have several versions of this module. One version that's existing, one version that's new, possibly something that's demo. All right. So now we have we have in this other file essentially different versions of the same part of the project. Um, and let's just keep it simple. There's an existing version, there's a new version. Now, when we're um, when we're uh, working on the project, we can go into the Hotlink module manager, and this legends here is linked to a particular file. What we can do potentially is we can relink to a different file. So let's imagine that we said we want to look at the building as it originally is before the renovation and we've got you know 18 queen units of this uh in in a hotel um well we can basically have the hot link module be the queen unit existing and then at some point we can go and say let I've, I've got a new version we'll update the hot link module to a different file which is different than updating it we're going to possibly relink it and when you do that it will then all of a sudden all of the those modules will become the new version. So that's not the same as being able to switch it in the views or switch it in the um, uh, the renovation palette, um, but you can create uh, let's say renderings. You can um, even generate drawings as long as those drawings are are made. Um, to manually update so you don't lose them. So you basically are carefully managing how the drawings are produced on the layout sheets. Instead of automatically updating all the time, you just say, I will update them when I have things ready for it to um, be revised. So uh, that would be my suggestion for uh, Paul. Um, now, if if you do in the source file have existing and demo and new, I think that that is respected when you choose, you know, which renovation filter you're using. I haven't actually tested that, but I think if you say, hey, just show me the existing stuff, hide the new stuff, and the hot link has stuff with uh, existing and, and new, um, that I think it will do that, but I haven't actually tested it. All right, so um, I will pass along those notes to Paul. Perhaps he'll find them useful, um, and I may try to get into the uh, um, clash detection thing because uh, I know I've, I've tested it, but I, I haven't used it for a year or two, so I, I don't I don't remember the details. All right, we are at the four-hour mark, and we're down to 44 hardy souls. So those of you who um, are have stayed on here. The whole time. I want to congratulate you for your stamina um, and uh, again invite you to um, consider joining one of my programs uh, here. If you do want to be able to get coaching anytime you need it, um, I do support via email as well as the uh, uh, webinars like this once a week. Um, you can go to archicadtraining.com slash coaching. I also do some private consulting here and there. I don't have a lot of time for it, but I do do an hour or two here or there when people um, just want me to work on their project. Um, training class, arcadetraining.com. You'll get uh, the benefit of my perspective and my explanations on a wide variety of arcade topics. I try to do it very systematically. Um, check that out. Um, and if you want a good working environment for building your project, Archicad template, Master Template um, is certainly something that I think you should check out. So uh, I want to thank you all for joining me today. This has been a fun and exhausting marathon, um, and uh, I hope you benefited from it. Um, so, okay, so Tom Palmer, I'm looking at the last comment. So you said, use an ID like ZZZ. Um, and then exclude this from the selection criteria of the door and window schedule or use the hotlink criteria to exclude hotlinks. So that's what I did finally. Now the ZZZ, that's fine. But what I like doing is if, if someone eye drops an element 
from the legend, I want the base ID to be usable. So for example, the electrical elements in the legend start with an, an ID starting with E, and the appliance ones start with A or you know AP or something like that. So instead of doing um, something that is totally excluded, I use the Hotlink master ID um, to do the criteria. That way the actual elements have normal types of IDs. So that's what I prefer. Um, okay, the filter, and Doug Muir says the filter is fantastic. I've kept another template like project open. Good, okay. Um, all right, and so a bunch of thank yous. Um, so next month, we'll see uh, for the Arcade user, um, I'm looking for projects, anyone who wants to share a project. So those of you who've been on for four hours, I imagine, you might have a project that would be worth looking at. And it can be either of two things. It can be a project that you're proud of and you think people will enjoy seeing and you'd be happy to talk about the architecture and about how you used ARCHICAD. Or it could be a project that you think is pretty good, but you have some challenges and, or you're just, you want to get it reorganized somewhat, um, or you want just a, an expert opinion on how you did things in ARCHICAD. Uh, potentially, I can do a project review um, in that context. Uh, so let me know if you're interested. You can uh, just drop me a line at support at bobro.com. All right. Um, so Michael Runyon, very helpful for 75 plus architect. You're very welcome. Um, so, and Kevin Jung learned a lot. All right. So, Thank you all, um, wish you the best, stay safe, stay healthy, be careful these days with the pandemic, um, and uh, just keep learning, keep uh, sharpening your ax. And if I can be of assistance, please let me know. You uh, certainly have seen some of the options that might be helpful for you. Take care, thanks for watching. <laughs>